Sunday talk. Good talk. News talk. Talk radio. The Tice Man cometh. Stir up your Sundays with Richard Tice. From global current affairs to the issues that hit closer to home. Richard Tice. On talk radio. A very, very good morning to you all. It is Sunday the 23rd of te- te- uh, No, it's January still. And it is Tice Talk for the next three hours. I hope you'll stay with me. We've got a fantastic show, action-packed. We're going to be talking about furlough, the companies that have given money back, but the companies that have taken your and my money, even though they're making huge profits. We're going to be talking about bullying and the whips, what's going on there. We've got to talk about NHS vaccine mandates. After the demonstrations yesterday, is the government going to have a change of heart, a change of mind? The Tories, they seem to be at war with each other. We've got to talk Ukraine. We've got a fantastic guest on that and the impact that could have on energy prices. The Home Office, uh, they took covering up illegal immigration numbers. We're going to be talking about that, of course. And school masks, zealots. Most schools have given up the masks, thankfully, but there's still a few hanging on. We'll be talking about that. And COVID restrictions, they're disappearing fast, but is it fast enough? Much, much more to come as well. We've got some great guests. We've got MPs. And we've got Bill Browder, uh, potentially one of Putin's main enemies in the West. He wrote that incredible book, Red Notice. He knows more about what's going on in Putin's mind and in Russia. And we'll have some great insights into the risk of Ukraine being invaded. And my big question to you, and I want your input, your thoughts, please. Vaccine mandates for NHS staff, should that be got rid of? Should it stay or go? And likewise, the civil service, the front page of the Daily Mail today, the Mail on Sunday, should the civil service get back to the office or not? I want your views, your thoughts on that. And that's how you make the show work. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text us, 8722, using the word talk or tweet, at talk radio. And of course, you can watch us downloading the app or on the website, YouTube, Apple TV, Samsung, Roku, Rakuten. There's no excuse. It's all there. Make sure you listen. Make sure you watch. Coming up, it's Tice Talk. It's Talk Radio. Richard Tice on Talk Radio. Well, as usual on Sunday, to start with, I give my Sunday sermon. And as I look out the the sky, I mean, it is dark and it is gloomy out there. But actually, there is some good news as well as some challenging news. The good news, you may recall just two weeks ago on my Sunday sermon, I predicted that there was change in the air and I gave some of the things that I thought would change in the coming weeks on already just two weeks later four of those changes those u-turns in government policy have already happened for example there's been a change in the cladding policy there's been a change in the vaccine passport policy a change in masks they're going a change in the isolation time policy so there is change in the air much of that actually is really good news and it's important to highlight the good news. And I think there is more to come. But I really want my Sunday sermon today, actually, to focus on something that I don't think has had enough coverage and enough exposure, and that is the issue of furlough. And we all remember at the start of the pandemic when we were all told to stay at home and there was huge concern, massive anxiety amongst all of us. Actually, one of the good early initiatives was the furlough scheme and credit to HMRC, who actually, and credit where credit's due, they implemented this scheme promptly, efficiently, by all accounts. And it was designed to save jobs, to prevent people being made redundant, designed to prevent, in particular, small firms from going under, to stop the anxiety and economic catastrophe and collapse. And it achieved that, which was brilliant. But let's be very clear about the furlough scheme. It was not designed to boost company profits, to prop up profits, to enable chief execs and chairmen to take out massive bonuses and for shareholders to take out massive dividends, having taken out big amounts from the furlough scheme. No, it was designed to protect jobs. That was the key thing. And let's just look at the numbers, shall we? about £68 billion was drawn by companies under the furlough scheme. And what's quite impressive, actually, is well over £1.3 billion has been voluntarily returned by companies to HMRC, to the Treasury, 
because companies actually did better than they feared initially. And that actually, for a variety of reasons, businesses did keep going. In some cases, uh, they adapted, they changed things, and uh, they were OK. And they kept people employed. And I think that's a really, really creditable thing. And I'd just like to say to those companies that did the right thing, I'd like to say a massive thank you. I think on behalf of all of these, our listeners, our viewers, and actually on behalf of taxpayers. And I'll give you some examples of the sort of companies who did the right thing. The likes of Primark, ASOS, IKEA, Halfords, the next one I like, Hotel Chocolate, one of my favourites, Auto, Auto Trader, and some of the big house builders like Redrow, Taylor Wimpy, Barrett's, some of the biggest estate agents like Knight Frank, and then a bookmaker, William Hill. They gave some 24 million back to the government. The DIY firm, B&Q, they gave about 23 million or so back to the government. And then a magazine, The Spectator magazine, whose subscriptions uh, maintained and actually, I think, grew, they gave money back voluntarily. And I think that is fantastic. They did the right thing. They looked at it and they had moral integrity. And they knew what was the real reason for the furlough scheme and that actually, having drawn it, it turned out they didn't need it, so they gave the money back. That's all about adapting and just doing the right thing. But I want to highlight the companies that I'm afraid have taken a very, very different approach. Yes, let's look at an estate agent, shall we? Let's look at Foxton's, for example. They took seven million of furlough money, whilst the chief executive took uh, over one and a half million pounds in salary and bonuses. They're paying dividends. They're now making significant profits again as a listed company. Interestingly, some of their shareholders, some of the pension funds, clearly feel uncomfortable about it, as almost 40% didn't back the remuneration report. So yes, they're back making big profits, they've got substantial cash sums. I think, hmm, I'm not so sure that they're doing the right thing. Let's look at JD Sports, shall we? Uh, despite they've taken some £61 million, pounds, despite the chairman taking over £4 million pounds in bonus and fees, etc. And the company's predicting a profit uh, for 2021 of well over half a billion pounds. Really? Are you doing the right thing, JD Sports? Then let's look at an accounting firm, shall we? BDO. Apparently they took over £4 million pounds in furlough money. And yet their partners in the firm took well over half a million pounds each in to, uh, the last year. I'm thinking, really guys, did you really need to take that furlough? Should you be giving some of it back? Then let's look at another DIY firm. Whilst the likes of B&Q were giving money back, oh no, Homebase, they've taken some 25 million pounds in furlough, but yet they've paid a big dividend uh, and they've, you know, it, sorry, let me rephrase that. They took over 10 million pounds in furlough and yet they've paid a dividend of over £25 million pounds to their shareholders. I just don't think this is right. I think this is morally wrong. But the biggest one I want to focus on is another uh, bookmaking business, Ladbrokes. Yes, Ladbrokes have taken over £100 million pounds of taxpayers' cash in furlough. And yet... They will make profits, forecast profits for 2021 of over £200 million. Pounds. They'll be reinstigating their dividend. And I just think that is completely and utterly wrong. And they gave a trading update in this last week when they were talking about growth, 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 success, success, success. That's great. I love hearing about businesses that are doing well, but not at the expense of taking money from some of the least well-off in terms of taxpayers and giving it to well-paid chief executives, chairmen and their shareholders. I just think that is completely and utterly wrong. And what I'm saying to you listeners is perhaps we should vote with our feet with these businesses. Why don't we use the estate agents that have given money back 
and not use those that I think have done the wrong thing. Maybe we shouldn't shop at JD Sports. Maybe we should, we should use customer power. Maybe we should move our accounts from Ladbrokes, if you're a, a gambler, to someone like William Hill. Maybe we shouldn't shop at Homebase, but we should use B&Q instead. And maybe I won't use BDO for accounting advice and use someone else. Because actually, we the customers, we have the purchasing power. And I think we need to tell these businesses they're doing the wrong thing. Now, I did actually ask the Ladbrokes bosses if they wanted to come on the show. And the invitation is still open. But you can guess their answer, can't you? Silence. Absolute stony silence. Well, I'm going to keep asking. And actually, I might even go to their shareholders meeting. I think it's in April, May time and ask the chief exec and the chairman then if we get no reply. Because I think that actually, if your business is doing well, fine, you took furlough in the short term. But if you're now making big profits, if you're handing money back to shareholders in dividends, if you're paying big bonuses, then actually you should hand the money back to the taxpayers. I think it's morally reprehensible. I think it's greedy. I think it's an abuse of taxpayer support taking money from the poorest to give it to shareholders amongst whom are some of the wealthiest. I think it gives those businesses a really bad, bad name. I think it gives capitalism a bad name when the chief executives haven't got that moral integrity. And it's one of my personal crusades for this year. I've got a hashtag. Maybe we'll get it going. Hashtag give it back. That is my Sunday sermon for this morning. Stay with us because coming up, we're going to be talking about Boris's shenanigans, Partygate, we've got MPs coming on. And of course, later in this hour, we're going to be talking about the immigration numbers, the Home Office deciding to cover up the numbers. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Radio. A new lineup for a new generation. Essential, edgy, engaging. Advanced postulation for any angry nation. Ask for it by name. Talk Radio. The home of common sense. Welcome back to Ties Talk here on this rather grey and gloomy Sunday. Well, that's got people going my Sunday sermon, talking about the furlough money, the companies that have done brilliantly and voluntarily given money back to the Treasurer. I think that's fantastic. But I'm afraid there are too many big companies, greedy companies, that have taken the money. We've got a comment here uh, from, uh, from a text message coming. Maybe the government should introduce an emergency law if you took money from, uh, from the government during COVID and then paid dividends and significant salaries maybe uh, it should be repaid over three years. Uh, question here about councils that took f uh, put staff on furlough. Uh, David says, I don't see a reduction in council tax. Interesting. I think that's going to get people going, and I want this hashtag uh, to get some traction. Hashtag give it back. And I will put up a list of companies that I'm aware of that have done the right thing, give it back, but also companies that haven't. And maybe they're still thinking about it. And if they are, maybe we can nudge them in the right direction. I think it's really important. It's just companies have got to do the right thing in order to maintain confidence in capitalism in free markets. For those of you who couldn't watch us at the beginning on YouTube, I think that we are back up and running, hopefully. And now I'm delighted to be joined to talk about uh, what's going on in Parliament, uh, the various sort of allegations of bullying and blackmail from whips and things, to be joined by Alistair Carmichael, the MP for the Liberal Democrats for Orkney and the Shetlands, who's their spokesman on Home Affairs, Northern Ireland and Constitutional Reform. Alistair, a very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. So, Good morning, uh, Richard. On, on we go, week after week. This saga continues, party after party after party, mm -hmm. rave after rave. It, it's hard to know where to begin and end. But, Alistair, I think actually, in a sense, the thing that's really... Uh, shocked people this week was the allegations about uh, bullying and blackmail from yeah. the whips to uh, individual members of parliament. And look, you've been a, a an MP for you know a, a good number of years, and I'm, I guess uh, in a sense many people say, well, it's just it's always been like that. But well, what's yeah. the difference, Alistair, between <clears throat> negotiation? and a bit of leverage, and bullying and blackmail? Well, you know, it, it hasn't always been like this, and this is why you have had the reaction that you have seen in the last few days. Um, because, you know, look, I was, in fact, for a time, a, my own party's chief whip in, in the coalition years, so I'm not naive and I, I'm not squeamish when it comes to having difficult conversations, but that was what it was always about. Because actually, if you look at what William Ragg was saying, for example, the idea that you would or wouldn't get a school or a hospital or some project for your constituency if you were going to uh, vote against the government, that takes it to an entirely new level, quite apart from anything else. And, and is that genuinely... We, think, we all think that actually these things get funded because they are the right thing of to course. do and they come in the right place of public priorities. But Alistair, it is shouldn't that, just be, yeah. Is that genuinely a new level of uh, negotiation, leverage stroke, arm twisting stroke, uh, blackmail and bullying? Or is actually, has this existed but no one's dared to sort of out it before? Well, I mean, I can only talk from my own experience. And yes, from my own experience, it absolutely is a new level. Um, you know, I can't categorically say that it's never happened in the past, but I was genuinely shocked. And as you say, I've been a member of Parliament now for, well, over 20 years, in fact. Um, and I think, actually, what it says to me is that all the talk about parties and the rest of it, which, you know, people sometimes say to me, well, you know, Luke, have we not talked, have we not got better things to talk about? Actually does matter because it, the talk about parties is an illustration of the fact that this is a government where the people at the heart of it think that the rules don't apply to them, that somehow or another, the rules are for, for other people and not for them. And actually, when you hear what William Ragg and others have said, then, in fact, you begin to realise that 
the talker or the significance about them thinking about the rules don't apply to them goes well beyond whether there was cheese and wine at, at work events, as I believe they're called in Downing Street these days. I mean, it does appear to me that that the Tory party is almost at war with itself. It, it almost feels like that the differences between oh. some of the MPs are, are similar to the differences that they had over Brexit, believe it or not. You know, you've got the defenders of the Prime Minister, uh, and okay. then you've got obviously many people who've either submitted letters uh, or thinking about putting in letters, or, uh, you know, they've written them, but they haven't yet uh, actually sent them to Sir Graham Brady. And then you've got the likes of William Ragg, who seems on, on quite a crusade uh, for whatever reason against the Prime Minister. But actually, many of uh, uh, of my listeners, talk radio listeners, are now really feeling, Alistair, that actually the challenges facing the country, the cost of living crisis, uh, the potential invasion by Russia of Ukraine, these are actually bigger issues. And, and maybe we've just got to, frankly, suck it up. This is how the Prime Minister behaves. He's eccentric. He's, he just thinks he, the rules don't apply to him. And in a sense... We've just got to just got to live with it. Where, well, Richard, where is the line there? I, I was sitting listening to your Sunday sermon at the start there, and you were very rightly saying that you know people or companies who have taken money that they didn't need should give it back, not because there's any legal obligation, but because it's in the wider interests of people thinking that capitalism is an acceptable way of running our economy. And I think the same arguments apply here for Boris Johnson. You know, it is his willingness not to, uh, to, to accept or to try and explain away what he's done that uh, does then risk bringing the wider politics uh, into disrepute. And at the end of the day, that matters, you know, and it will be bad for us all if we lose faith in our democratic process. And, you know, you said the, the Conservatives are almost at war in the way that they were over Brexit. Well, I saw their war over Brexit, and it was pretty messy at times, let me tell you. But there is a genuine personal viciousness, and it's a very different cast list this time. Remember, people like David Davis were uh, very much on Boris Johnson's Boris Johnson's side when it came to, to Brexit. He was a big advocate of, of Brexit. And uh, I mean, I was in the members' tea room of the House of Commons on Wednesday afternoon after he made his intervention. And let me tell you, there was no almost about it when it came to them being at war. You know, that was open, naked aggression. It was pretty vicious. And, um, you know, that that's uh, it's difficult to see how they then reform as a government a, a party that is able to lead us in a, a you know in a direction whatever it's going to be at one of the most difficult times that well, we've, we've I th got ahead I think, of us. i think this is the point isn't it because actually uh, this can be and i suspect is and you've seen it in the tea rooms it sounds like mm. a massive massive distraction from the big decisions that need to be taken in order to help everybody in particular uh, some of those on the lowest incomes, the poorest in society, who are most exposed to the cost of living crisis, yeah. the energy price crisis, I'm going to be talking about it later, you know, the impact of Ukraine and things. There's some really important decisions that need to be made uh, to help people through this crisis, which is which is not of any of our making. It's, it's, it's essentially global events. It's actually yeah. primarily because of uh, Tory incompetence in outsourcing our energy policy to other countries. Um, and, and that's another story. But where where are you? Where's the where, where's the Liberal Democrat uh, policy on uh, the cost of living crisis, on things like uh, VAT on domestic fuel, on uh, the levies, the environmental levies, on electricity bills? Uh, are you crystal clear what needs to be done? In terms of the, the energy prices and the, the wider cost of living, yes, I mean, look, there are a whole range of things that government need to be doing because, look, I, I represent Orkney and Shetland and, I, you know, it's not maybe the, the greatest post we'd want to make, but we have the longest, darkest winters anywhere in the United Kingdom and we have the highest rates of fuel poverty. So there are absolutely things that need to be done in the, in the uh, first instance. You spoke about uh, the... A idea of, of VAT and fuel, the warm homes discount, you know, we think that should be increased. Um, and there are things also 
to, uh, to to go back to our earlier theme, that the energy companies themselves should be doing, because for them to be making uh, windfall profits at a time like this, I think, frankly, is, is obscene. So, so uh, would you would you favour a windfall tax on them? Sorry, yes, we would. Um, this this is what needs to be done in the right here and now, because you know, January and February are probably going to be the most difficult months of the winter for an awful lot of people, and then. When you're looking at the bigger picture, there are things that you can do in the medium to longer term to bring a bit more fairness into that market and do a bit to rebalance the massive power that you've got in the big six energy companies on the one hand, the few remaining energy companies and the consumer on the other. But, you know, look, these are all high fluting issues but these, for, a, for but another there, there day. Some... I want to get money into people's pockets right in the here and now. Well, that's the point, isn't it, Alistair? Because these are big decisions. And my concern is possibly Rishi Sunak, if he's got his eye on uh, becoming the next prime minister, maybe he hasn't got his eye enough on making the important, rapid, fast decisions to help uh, the neediest, the least well-off, <laughs> who can't afford these energy bills. It, it, exactly. And it's human nature. It's not just politics, you know. Uh, we all only have so much bandwidth. Uh, and that's why Boris Johnson remaining, when really I think the rest of the world can see that his time is up, uh, is a massive distraction and one which, you know, as long as he remains there, there, we're not going to be able to get the, the things that we need to do in on, on energy prices. On the Ukraine, you've mentioned it there as well. And uh, in the meantime, in the other side of the world, you see that China continues to behave oh, in the way absolutely. That's, that's another whole story. Alistair, thank you so much for your thoughts there. That was Alistair Carmichael, the Liberal Democrat MP for Orkney and Shetlands, on his thoughts about the decisions that need to be taken. Coming up, we're going to be talking about how the Home Office is covering up the immigration numbers this year. I wonder why. We'll be talking to Al Mehmet. Keep the calls coming in 0344 499 1000. It's Tice Talk on Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Richard Tice on Talk Radio. World headquarters of Common Sense. Talk Radio. Listen on DAB+. Plus. Watch it live on your smart TV. Richard Tice. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. And that's certainly got people going. Keep the calls coming in 0344 499 1000. And some interesting tweets coming in here. Keith says, uh, what's happened to Talk Radio? If we're not interviewing Labour politicians, you've got a Scottish Liberal Remainer tearing into the government. Not impressed at all. That was from Keith. Well, that's one side of it. Equally, on the other side, we've got... Uh, a tweet that's come in. I'm sick of this. We've more important things to worry about. I can think about many things at once. And uh, it says, a, when a politician tells me to obey laws and then does the opposite, it's very important, trust and honour. So there's a great range of views coming in there. Uh, so it's really, really... Uh, we've got to talk about this stuff. And I think it's right to have a range of different opinions. And we shouldn't tr just have... Uh, views from Tory MPs, for example. We should try and get Labour on. I have asked them, actually. They seem rather reluctant. And it's good to have the views from other parties. That's what debate and discussion is all about. And we have to discuss uh, another big issue that came out this week, which is the Home Office have decided they're not going to release any more uh, daily numbers of the illegal crossings coming over the English Channel. No, they're going to release them quarterly. Yes, quarterly. This was after the news that they were going to bring in uh, the Navy to oversee and control the operation. And I think you have to ask, what's going on here? What's the motivation of the Home Office in these decisions? My concern with the Navy taking charge is that actually what they're really looking to do is to... Uh, they're going to pick up almost everybody coming across uh, halfway across the channel as opposed to dinghies being seen uh, to come on to uh, English beaches with all that that, that looks like on the TV screens. Um, but arguably, it'll actually increase the numbers of people coming because the smugglers, the vile people smugglers, they'll say, well, it's even safer than ever because you'll be picked up at the 12-mile line by the Royal Navy. So who knows what that may do to the numbers. Some people are predicting well over 50,000 uh, 50, people this year. And so I'm delighted to be joined now by Alp Mehmet, Chairman of Migration Watch, to talk about this. Alp, a very good morning to you. Thanks good for morning, being with us. So this news that they're going to release the numbers only quarterly, not daily. Uh, what do you make of that and the government's reasoning for that? <laughs> I'm not sure about their reasoning, but I think they're running scared, frankly. It's a very bad idea, and I think the sooner they think again, the better. I wonder, I just wonder whether um, this was an idea floated just to see how it would uh, take off. And people have made very clear that this is not the way to go about it. I, I know they've said also, they've hinted that it's all going to be handed over to uh, the, the MOD, to, to the Royal Navy. They will be pick, picking them up. They will be detaining them. The MOD will put them into camps. Yeah, fine. Uh, but then the Home Office is still responsible for immigration policy, for goodness sake. And what's going to happen at the end of them spending however long? And I, from what I'm hearing, it's not going to be very long at these camps it's going to be a matter of days um, that they're the rumors i don't know how accurate they are at the moment we've got something like getting close on to seventy thousand uh, asylum seekers awaiting a first decision on their application Sixty-eight thousand five hundred was what it was at the last uh, set of figures that were issued of those 32,000 have been waiting for over a year, for goodness sake. Now, if the government is serious and they're going to hang on to all those people uh, until a decision is taken and then those who are refused to be returned, great. But, but, but if, if, doubt that's what's your prediction? Happen. What's your prediction out for the numbers this year? Uh, to come across the channel. Last year was just under 30,000. You've said there were some 68,000 asylum seekers waiting a decision. I think almost none were de uh, deported uh, last year. So this year, what number are you predicting at uh, Migration Watch? 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm not Mystic Meg. I'm not uh, <laughs> going to make predictions. But then what I will say is that if you look at what's been going on this month, it's already four times. This month is four times higher. The numbers coming across uh, four times higher than they were in January last year. Wow. Now, it doesn't take a genius to work out if uh, you multiply 28,400, which is the number that came across last year, if you multiply that by four, what is going to happen? Now, I'm not going to say that that is going to continue throughout the year. However, what is very clear is that the demand is there, and I'm afraid that the number, whatever it is, is going to be a lot higher than 28,400. And then the big question, of course, is where are those people going to be going to go? Because it's pretty clear that they've essentially run out of hotels uh, to rent in their entirety to fill those up. They've been putting people into uh, private rented accommodation. They've been renting homes up and down the country. And that's having the effect of actually pushing up rents in local areas which makes it harder for young people to rent homes. So where are these people going to be going to go? They're talking about uh, camps on army land. I mean, you're talking about a, a 60,000 people potentially if it was double last year's number. I mean, this is this is huge. It is. And, and that is really um, you give a, a sense of the costs of all this as numbers go up, the cost of the whole system just escalates. At the moment, uh, according to the Home Office, it's nearly 1.5 uh, billion pounds that it's costing. That's going to go up. Housing, well, we've heard from the Home Secretary that there is very little housing available for those who are being brought in from Afghanistan, let alone those who are coming across the Channel. So, yeah, th th they've got to think carefully about how they're going to accommodate them if they're going to hold on to those coming across illegally in camps then i'm afraid they've got to think long term it's not simply a case of grabbing a few headlines look what we're doing we're putting them in camps now when within a few days weeks whatever they're actually off into uh, into the communities up and down the country and you talk about long term and there's been suggestions that Indeed, it's part of the Nationality and Borders Bill that so many Tory MPs are sort of hanging their hat on, hoping that'll change things. They talk about offshore processing centres, one suggestion being in the essential island. Is that really credible, Alp? <laughs> well, um, it could be. I, I think that they are, from rumours that we, we get and uh, bits of briefing, that they have been trying to persuade a territory, a country, to um, house these people, to have camps on them. I'm not sure that they're anywhere near actually final agreement uh, with, with any particular country. But I, I go back to what I said earlier. OK, even if we do have uh, offshore processing centres or third country processing centres, fine. I think that's a good idea, frankly. But what do you do when the process is finished, when a decision is taken, will we then send them off somewhere and say, OK, off you go, wherever you like in, in Africa or wherever it is? I'm not sure that whichever country agrees to uh, uh, have these camps, which is what they're going to be, is actually going to be prepared to take thousands of migrants. Uh, However, what it might do is actually stop them crossing the channel. Well, ultimately, that's what has to happen, is you have to be able to cut off the business model, and that's that's what Australia succeeded in doing by uh, by returning the crossings Absolutely. to where they came from. Absolutely. Uh, but the, you, if, you just, uh, if you just put people in accommodation or camps uh, and you just grow that number, then, of course, the related cost grows, and that just grows, and it's billions and billions and billions, and guess whose money that is? That's that's all of, that's all of our listeners' rate. money, it's taxpayers' you, money, and it goes up and up. You're absolutely right, Richard. That that is exactly what's happening. But look, you 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 bring them in um, and and you you detain them. Fine, but no one seems to give a thought to the strength of the magnet 
the package that I think you've referred to it as. Um, you've got to change that as well. At the moment, the pull factor is immense. And I'm afraid that for so long, for so long as that pull factor exists, and indeed we're not removing anyone, then they will continue to come in ever increasing numbers. I think that's I think that's right, Alp. And just whilst we've been speaking, there's a uh, a tweet's come in from Mr. Woodward who says he believes they're moving to quarterly figures simply to make it easier to manage the numbers in the right direction for the government. Alp, thank you so much for your thoughts there. I know we'll be talking. Uh, through the course of the year. That's Alp Mehmet, Chairman of Migration Watch, with his thoughts. And uh, lots of messages coming in here. We've got one here. The numbers of migrants suggest the EU are turning a blind eye in revenge for the UK, leaving. That's from Jenny in Milton Keynes. Here's, this is interesting. Uh, from Adam, who says, my landlady's had over 100 applications for a single room within 24 hours. The housing crisis is at, is at boiling point, yet gets very little coverage. Uh, and I wonder how much of that is from the government looking for places. Meanwhile, oh dear, I've upset Les, I think. Uh, he says, I think Richard Tice needs to decide exactly which side he's on. Well, I'll tell you which side I'm on, Les. This is the side I've always been on. I want this country to be managed, to be run and to be governed properly and to stop wasting our taxpayers' cash and to create more growth by cutting taxes so that we can have better, faster, more efficient public services. It's very simple what we need to do. My concern is that it just never seems to happen. And occasionally, OK, occasionally it happens, but we could do so much better, Les. That's what I'm trying to do, and that is the side that I am on. Keep those calls coming in 0344 499 1000, or keep the tweets coming in. There's a lot of fun here. Uh, there's another one here. Um, oh dear, this is another one I've upset. Uh, getting a balanced debate from a Liberal Democrat and reform leader isn't happening. Why is everybody willing to believe this rag bloke who's got a public vendetta against Boris? Well, there we are. Uh, that's the question. Is it a vendetta or is actually he holding up for standards? We need to find out. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
recipe ever. Talk radio. Captivating. Campaigning. Controversial. Powered by common sense. May cause mild irritation. The word on the street. Standing up for the little guy. Rewire your thinking. Talk radio. Welcome back to Ties Talk. Well, we've been talking about the uh, immigration numbers there, and that's certainly got people going. Uh, we've got one tweet here which says the migrant crisis will never... Uh, where has that gone? I've lost that one. Uh, will never end without the help of the French, and that isn't going to happen. That's from Laurie in Wellin. Uh, we've got another one here. Why don't they use the uh, some of the redundant cruise ships uh, as holding points offshore? I think that is just very, very short-term. It's not a long-term answer. Of course, the real answer is we've got to stop uh, the business model uh, in the first place so that people realise that there's no point spending the money because they won't get across to the English shores. Uh, meanwhile, Jane says perhaps MPs should cancel recess and cancel talking about Partygate. Instead, use Parliament time to discuss how to actually help people pay their fuel bills. And I think that is the big issue facing millions and millions of people up and down the country. It's the fuel crisis, the energy crisis, the increase in those bills. And I'm afraid to say that what may happen in Ukraine could increase these numbers even further. Anyway, we've got Richard in Manchester with some thoughts. Richard, a very good morning to you. What would you like to say? Good morning, Richard. Thank you uh, very much indeed for having me on your show today. Your, your sermon was uh, absolutely spot on. It was truthful and it was to the point. And everybody listening, should 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 you should put it on the open air with, with BBC and ITV and all them, Richard. For, for, for them well, it's, it's, it's really see. important. And I'd be delighted to be proved wrong, Richard, and for those companies to ring us up and say, actually, we've already repaid it. Great, fantastic. Why are they waiting? That would be good, but I don't think that's going to happen. But I, I, can I just uh, allude to what uh, Carl Michael said in his uh, address to you? That, uh, you know, it was like a war at PMQs uh, this week, and it got to stop. And I'm afraid, I honestly am afraid, that these guys like Blackford and uh, Sakir and all these, they're going to regret what they've done to Boris, because I think he will fight back. If, if he... Uh, can do what Nigel Farage did in the EU and fight them and get us a victory, then I'm sure Boris, because of yourself and, and Nigel, um, giving uh, telling us to step down as a Brexit party and, and give him an 80 majority, which you did, and that's the truth, then I, I think he can hit back and he can hit back hard. So, so Richard, would you, would, you, would you like him to stay and deal with the big issues, the big challenges that, that, that face us all? I think he will do that anyway, Richard. I think this is just, you know, arguing about a few drinks. I bet you've had a few drinks and Nigel's had a few drinks and we've all had a few drinks. But they're making it as a, a whip to smack the dog with and it's terrible. I don't like people kicking a man when he was down. And, and Nigel's had it many, many times, as probably you have in your business world. It's a disgrace. Yes, it, indeed. I think, I think people the, will it, see through it. it. It's that difference, isn't it? And I think that people are very split on this. Uh, even just the messages coming through this morning, between those who say, well, hang on, it, the reality is that Number 10 was making the rules at the very same time as they knew that they weren't following them. And the, the emotional impact for so many people who couldn't say goodbye to loved ones who, who sadly were dying, uh, they couldn't bury their own loved ones and say that final farewell. You know, that emotionally is absolutely massive. Uh, as opposed yeah. to those who also say, well, we understand that, but actually we've got a face into the future. This Prime Minister was elected, and yes, Boris is Boris. In a sense, we all know his frailties, but actually just let him and his team get on with making some quick, big, important decisions on these challenges. And It feels to me people are increasingly split on this. Can you, can you answer me a question? Who, you're a professional politician, who would you put in charge at this moment, at this next 24 hours in the Commons or this next week or two? Who would you put in charge instead of Boris? It's, it, it, it just baffles me. I think about it and I, I can't come to a conclusion. Well, ultimately, that would be a decision for the Conservative members and I, I'm not going to sort of state a preference. Uh, my preference is, is that they make some big, important decisions collectively and quickly to deal with the cost of living crisis, to deal with the energy crisis, to get using British gas and shale gas, 
because that's the way that actually they can uh, make things better for, for tens of millions. Uh, those are the most important uh, decisions. I think it's going to be fascinating what happens this week. Boris doesn't have many friends in Parliament no. amongst the Tory MPs. It's going to be absolutely fascinating. But overall, I suspect he'll still be there up until the May elections, Richard. Richard, let, 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 let's have a, a full election and bring your force of 17.4 million. Well, let's, we'll all let's support you and Nigel and let us get in and get a new party in where we can change the laws and do it with like a breath of fresh air. Well, and that's Richard, what I'm looking forward to. We're certainly trying to shape an influence, that is for sure. Thank you, Richard, in Manchester. And meanwhile, we're going to go down to Dorset to speak to uh, Derek. Derek, a very good morning. How are you doing down in lovely Dorset? Well, uh, let me say first, it is a beautiful place. Um, sadly, all I can offer is the University of Life. I, I agree with everything you said uh, this morning. Um, I've got a couple of reservations. Uh, the furlough campaign, repaying that money, um, you're absolutely right. That money should go to help pay for NHS and care um, homes. You're absolutely right. In fact, I can't fall out with you much. Anything you've said, um, in fact, you, you'd make a good prime minister. Well, bless um, you. I've, I've upset a few of the uh, people on Twitter, that is for sure. I've even lost a couple of listeners, but there we go. Now, uh, could I just say a few points? I voted for Brexit. Um, as most people did, because we thought we'd get control of the borders. We haven't got control of our borders. And I think now, Richard, um, that we've handed uh, Sturgeon split up of the UK on a plate, as particularly Boris. If they had a vote now, the UK would split up. What would stop it if we had another vote on Brexit? Because... Um, some time ago, I warned on talk radio about the weakness of Europe and how Putin would step in um, and exploit that weakness. And he's, he's, he's doing that. He, he's doing it. And, and stay listening, Derek. At uh, 12 o'clock, we're going to have a fascinating discussion with Bill Browder. I don't think the country could tolerate another vote on Brexit, but I would like, Derek, a referendum on uh, the government's net zero plans because I think they are ruinous for the country and they will send our jobs and money uh, well, to the yeah. likes of Russia. Would you like a referendum on net zero, Derek? Absolutely. We should open up our gas fields, our fracking. That money could go to help tidal energy, um, green energy, to help pay for the NHS in care homes. Sadly, we've got no common sense. And I can tell you about the Home Office. Um, I work for them in the prison service, and I'll give you one example. When I was a young officer, I finished up an acting governor of two big London prisons. Uh, I thought, I'd better read the instructions. I was taking 40 prisoners to the Isle of Wight, and this is the instruction from the public school boys in the Home Office. Should the ferry sink, the prison party will swim together. Well, they were all handcuffed, and... Um, I looked at this, I thought, what idiot wrote this instruction? Uh, uh, we Should the fairies think we will speak... Uh, My God, the well, that, that doesn't... That doesn't, together. That doesn't come from the Home Office. Doesn't sound much like common sense there uh, from the Home Office, which we know is, in my view... Uh, trying to cover up the numbers on the uh, the immigration numbers. Uh, Derek, thank you so much for those thoughts. That was Derek in Dorset uh, with his views and his concerns. Uh, we've got a tweet come in from Janice who says, we don't have anyone in government with the backbone to get a proper grip of the dinghy problem, get some guts and get something done now. It is a huge issue and my concern is that in a sense we know it's going to get much, much worse worse. Uh, this is interesting from Christine who says, the statement David Davis made in the Commons telling Boris to go uh, is uh, he's playing a crafty game, he's only doing it to save his seat in the elections. I'm not sure I agree with that Christine. Uh, David Davis is he's certainly very uh, open, independent minded uh, how long he took to make up that decision I'm not sure but uh, there we are. Uh, interesting here from, uh, who's this from? 
can't quite see from Albert, I think it was, who says uh, it's easy to cure the migrant crisis. We've got the, ha the infrastructure. We can assemble night. If we can assemble nightingales, then we can have the same done for the migrants. Hang on, using redundant stadiums like Lords, the Oval, and the Headingley. What are you talking about? These are sporting stadiums for some of our greatest sporting events that this country enjoys. I don't know where you're going with that. That is utterly extraordinary. Dear, oh dear. Anyway, coming up after the top of the hour, we're going to be talking to Liz Cole, the co-founder of Us For Them, about the schools that are still insisting on wearing masks in schools, despite the fact the government had li has lifted the mask ban. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Mid morning talk. Sunday talk. Talk radio. Take a chance with the Tice Man. Talk radio. Richard Tice. Sunday morning devotion. There isn't a sermon. Talk radio's common sense weekend. Richard Tice. On talk radio. Welcome back to Tice Talk. We're already into the second hour of the, sh- of the show. I don't know where the first hour went, but anyway, we've got lots coming up. Uh, keep the messages coming in and also the calls 0344 499 1000. We've got a, a message come in here. Those who defend Boris parties are the ones who sat in their cosy homes over lockdowns, oblivious to the, pri- to the plight of real people with real problems. We've got another one here from, I think it's Kelt, who says... No, we want to vote on the green tax, uh, foreign aid, um, the Northern Ireland Protocol and illegal migrants. Actually, I like referendums. I like direct democracy. I rather like what the Swiss do, which is when they've got big issues, they ask the people. And that way, politicians really know what the people feel. So, yes, I would certainly like a referendum, for example, on net zero. Anyway, keep those uh, messages coming in and the calls coming in. I'm delighted now to be joined by Liz Cole, the co-founder of the parent group Us For Them, who's done so much, uh, essentially, on behalf of children uh, to get schools open, to keep schools open, and also to try and get rid of one of the biggest impediments to learning in schools, which is these dreadful, dirty, smelly masks and cloths that teachers uh, and unions have been forced, forcing children to wear. Liz, a very good... Uh, morning to you thanks for joining us now i know that uh you folks have have in a sense i think possibly last week achieved something uh, amazing which is that your threat to sue the government over masks for school children may actually have played a massive role in their decision to remove masks uh from classrooms and i think is it this week they're going to be removed from corridors uh but but tell us what about all these hundreds of schools uh, that have decided actually they're not going to remove the requirement to wear masks? What, what's going on there and why? Yeah, so I think this is something that sadly we expected was going to happen. Um, we knew that the, the battle was going to continue, to be honest, because of what we've seen throughout the pandemic of um, it being very much a postcode lottery in terms of what restrictions children are actually subjected to um, in schools. So immediately um, the the government announced that they would lift the mask, um, effectively the mandate. Um, Students um, were receiving letters saying actually that was going to continue. And I think what this reflects really um, is a tendency to sort of gold plate restrictions throughout. So if we're saying let's open the window a crack for some ventilation, we then have schools with windows wide open, doors open and children shivering in their coats Um, and actually what happened here is that by reintroducing masks um, in January the government's really made a rod for its own back um, and opened a Pandora's box that now they're going to have to try to close um, by bringing these local authorities um, back into line and saying no we want children to have an unimpeded um, educational experience which is the right call. Have you got a sense of the number of secondary schools that appear to be continuing with the mask mandate in classrooms? It's hundreds. Um, hundreds? I mean, hundreds, yeah. It, immediately, our inbox was was full. Um, our Facebook group was, wow. was full of posts where um, it was continuing. And I think what really strikes us about this is it is that it's, the, it, it's a reluctance to lift this, um, that clearly in some areas, you know, they, they want this this to continue and I think it's based on a really false premise that actually um, a it's going to have any impact on transmission um, and I do accept head teachers are under a lot of pressure but there was no evidence there was going to be any impact on but, transmission but where, where are they where are they on pressure from is it the unions or from individual teachers in their schools yeah, I mean, we do sense that there um, is some, you know, evidence of, of union pressure and also navigating a course between parents who may have, have have different views. But I think there's also a denial here about the harm of mask wearing, because what we see is where they continue with the restrictions. What the message will typically say is our students don't mind, they're not bothered, uh, children are resilient and, and we're going to carry on with this measure. Um, but actually, I think that is denial, and, and it just simply isn't true 
when we know that 55% of, of students interviewed, uh, surveyed by the government, said it made it more difficult for them to learn. Um, and the primary function of a school is a place of learning. So this is a significant harm that we can't just wish away by saying that there, this is a harm-free well, even, intervention. Even, indeed, I mean, even the Prime Minister himself, I remember him uh, saying to the camera that actually masks, and this was some time ago, uh, masks impeded learning, and he was very much against it. But it seems to me you've got the unions, firstly, they were complaining uh, before the vaccine came out that they had to protect the teachers and, the, and that the teachers were being faced with harm if schools were open or if masks weren't worn. Now everybody's had the opportunity of having the vaccine and the, the vast, vast, vast majority of people who had the vaccine. The unions are still complaining. I mean, when are they ever going to be satisfied? So they complained before the vaccine. Now they're complaining post the vaccine. Are these people psychopaths? Are these sadists? Do they actually want our children to suffer harm and not to learn? I, I find it utterly bemusing. I think the role of the unions throughout this has been um, deeply dispiriting, actually. And obviously, their role is to represent their members. But actually, many teachers are not represented um, by a union. Many of the teachers that are in you know, support us for them have left um, unions as a result of various things throughout this. If you recall, when schools closed in a year ago, um, in January 2021, despite us knowing what harm that was going to cause, um, the unions were jubilant about that. They were, they said, we did it. You know, um, it, it was cause for a celebration. But actually, it's not a cause for celebration. There aren't any winners um, when it comes to children and their education. Um, so I really think that um, you know this is you know becoming much more about a relationship and tension between the government and the unions than it is about actually what's going to be best for children. Um, and I think Nadim Zahawi has made the right call here um, to try to um, put some uh, measures in place to actually keep um, keep control and say we, we really don't want masks in classrooms. Do you think that it may come to the that actually the government and Nadim Zahawi have to issue formal, uh, whether it's legislation or formal guidance, not to wear masks in order to stop this? I think so. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to unpick. And as I said earlier, I think it's partly of their own making. I think there'll have to be some kind of statement saying that schools cannot mandate for, for children to wear masks. Obviously, if, if children may want to choose to do that, that's a, a different issue for separate discussion. But I think imposing and, and forcing children effectively to wear masks when they don't want to um, is going to need some some leadership and and strong statement or, or legislation and and now's the moment really and i guess actually this is you know we've been talking about the sort of the distractions of party gate and everything and all that that's going on these are the really big important decisions that the likes of nadim sahawi as education secretary he's he's got to show some courage and some real leadership on and 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 be bold on behalf of children and say, no, enough's enough. You know, we, we, we've done this. I mean, his own department evidence was was sketchy at best. Uh, 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 at worst, actually, it argued against masks. Absolutely. Uh, for my reading of it. Uh, you know, are you confident that he's going to show that leadership over the coming weeks? I hope so. I'm seeing more, definitely more positive signs there um, from him calling directors of public health together, saying, actually... Um, you must run any um, any plans to reintroduce masks by me. And I think that's going in in the right direction. Um, but I do think that really it's going to have to be stronger because actually um, enough is enough. And what's happened here is, is a moral failure. Um, and what it needs now is, is very strong leadership, as you say, to lead us out of this because we have to put children first well, now. We, we do, Liz. And I was reading in the one of the papers this morning that the report's coming out that one in five children arriving in secondary school uh, this school year, they cannot read properly uh, compared to uh, the, you know, the normal reading age. Indeed, some of them have got a reading age of six, uh, even though they're you know, arriving at school aged 11. I mean, this is just a clear sign of the catastrophe that's happened over the last 18 months. 
It's an absolute catastrophe, and that is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, one of the really concerning things is the impact on um, speech and language development, um, which we've been hearing about, which obviously has huge repercussions throughout school life, um, impacts on mental health, impacts on children who are falling um, off the radar. Um, and so I think for people and for adults to say that children are resilient, which they still are saying, um, without any irony at all, when you have this litany of impacts across a different spectrum of childhood, um, is absolutely abhorrent, to be honest. Um, these adults who've had their education and their childhoods themselves um, and see no, nothing wrong with actually wanting to um, pile more and more on our children. Um, uh, uh, it, it's actually sickening. It, it really is. And just whilst we've been talking, Liz, I've had a uh, tweet here from Peter who says the unions will only be happy when there's a Labour government. Nothing else matters to them. I, I find that unbelievable that actually uh, they wouldn't care about the interests of children. I fear that even if there was a Labour government, they'd still be asking for masks for children. Liz, thank you so much for your thoughts. That's fantastic. That was uh, Liz Cole, the co-founder of Us For Them. They've done so much to campaign for children. I think they've made a massive difference. And maybe this week uh, they actually forced the Education Secretary to make the right decision in getting rid of masks in classrooms and very soon getting rid of them in corridors. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Don't hold back. You know the number. Uh, you can send us a tweet. We'll read out the messages. Stay with us. It's Tice Talk. It's Talk Radio. Richard Tice on Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Talk radio. Fish bosh berserk. Full contact. Common sense conversation. Lively debate. Now with zero percent drift and dither. Always read the label. A roadmap for the future of debate. Talk radio. 
Thank Welcome you. back to Ty's Talk. Well, that was Liz Cole there from Us For Them with her thoughts about the getting rid of masks and the schools that are still insisting that masks remain. And we'll be taking your calls in a second, but coming up later on this hour, we're going to be talking to Peter Bone about the speed of getting rid of COVID restrictions, which is so important, and also to Alan Miller, the founder of the Together Declaration, about whether or not the mandate, the vaccine mandate for NHS staff there are real signs, encouraging signs, hopeful signs that, yes, the government might defer this terrible, terrible uh, plan to fire NHS staff if they haven't been vaccinated. That looks encouraging. We'll get the latest from him. Uh, we've got some tweets that have just come in here. One from Leslie. What's been look overlooked from those people in power making all these lockdown rules were ignoring the rules themselves, which begs the question, and Leslie's right here, why were the rules introduced in the first place? And that is an absolutely critical question. And there were other countries, of course, that didn't impose these sort of rules. They adopted a more sort of level of guidance, such as what they did in, in Sweden and in Japan. They issued guidance to people ra rather than draconian authoritarian rules. Uh, meanwhile, we've got uh, another tweet in here uh, coming from... Pollyanna, who says it's not just the schools who are making children wear masks, local authorities, like apparently uh, she's saying Berry Council, are instructing schools to do it. That sounds interesting. I don't know uh, whether you've got any experience of other councils, but I think this is a massive issue, and I think parents need to really uh, absolutely make their feelings known very clearly to head teachers, to local authorities, if they're still managing the schools that actually they should follow the government guidance and get rid of the masks. Lenny is down in Ashford. Good morning to you, Lenny. What's going on in Ashford? Good morning, Richard. Well, it's uh, not the nicest of days, but uh, I'm tickety-boo and, lo and looking forward to see what I can uh, do during the day. Fantastic. Uh, what would you like to say to our lovely listeners, Lenny? Well, there's two things uh, I'd like to say. One is uh, regarding the immigrants... And what I said on the radio when Javid uh, first went to rescue them, I said he's making a big mistake without a plan. He went and rescued them, he, uh, and then he opened the floodgates. Well, wh wh when you say, I mean, obviously, obviously, when you say he rescued them, obviously, uh, you know, we've got to save lives at sea, but it's then having a plan, isn't it, as to... That is correct. Who, who's, uh, who's coming, what's the motivation, and what we do? Yeah, well, he didn't have a plan how to deter them. And what it was, simply, I mean, put them ashore and put them in hotels did not deter any of them from coming. Well, completely the opposite. And it acted as an attraction because, actually... What you saw was that the the people smugglers on the other side of the channel were able to use that as a sort of advertisement that it, um, you're going to get fantastic accommodation, uh, you're going to get uh, access to mobile phones, you're going to get paid a certain amount per week, and, and therefore uh, bring it on. And sure enough, the numbers increased. Well, even uh, you know the uh, the prime minister of France, he actually uh, you know said. It's all your own fault because you're making them too welcome. And can I just tell you the sim my, my simplest thing that I suggested? Go and for that it, Lenny. Was, yeah, and that was put a cruise ship in the channel, put them on there, no phones, no con uh, and and uh, no solicitors, so they're talking to them so they get the truth on who they are. And then... They can um, they can leave the cruise ship any time they want and go to any country in the world they want. The issue is, Lenny, that given the numbers we're talking about, the cruise ship will be filled up within about two or three days. So before That's you know it, you'll have an absolute flotilla of cruise ships. We've got to stop no. the business model completely, and that ultimately means some arrangement with France whereby they are returned to France. The moment that happens then the business model stops and we've seen the evidence in Australia that it stops. Lenny, thank you so much. Well, 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 well just one minute. I'll tell you, well, that, that is if they don't stop coming. On the, on the way they're coming, yes, you're right. But if they stop, if you deter them, that amount of people well, wouldn't have come. Well, that's right. And, uh, yeah, and the other thing is, regarding your attitude to having referendums, I think that is totally wrong 
because we need a, a, a parliament to govern us and sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. And the, and, and what it is, you cannot every, have everything you want whenever you want it. Now, that's interesting, Lenny. I hear what you say, but actually what happens when the government and all the parties in Westminster are completely out of touch with the people, such as they were on Brexit, Lenny, and also, as I think they are, on something as important as uh, the net zero plans, which are going to send our jobs and money overseas, Lenny. Surely we, the people, have a right to say if they want to change the way that we're going to have to lead our lives. Yeah, that, 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 that is a fair point. But what it is, you know, it's very easy for the people to tell their politicians what they want. Uh, yes, but the politicians are very good at not listening. You see it in Switzerland, though, Lenny, where you only have referendums for big issues, but it's a, it's a great, in a sense, sort of double check. It's a great sanity check for the politicians. That's why I like it. Lenny and Ashford, thank you so much for their thoughts. Uh, Lenny agrees with me on the need to stop the increasing numbers coming across the channel, but he doesn't agree with me on the need for more referendum. Meanwhile, I think we've got Sarah in London, or is it Sarah? Uh, Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, hi there. Hi, what would you like to say this morning, Sarah? I'd just talk about this, this issue about working from home and civil servants and all the noise that's going on around that. Um, I'm a public ser sector servant, not necessarily civil service, but it, it applies to me as well. I kind of work from home and um, we're looking to go back to the office. But I want to say that even before COVID, the plans were never for civil servants and all public sector workers to work five days a week from home. There's a, there's a report that the government property agency have put out, said the state of the estate which uh, with, and their plans were to reduce the government estate by 50% because actually it costs the taxpayers more for us to be sat in the offices in expensive London real estate five days a week and taxpayers are paying the equivalent of 10,000 per person per annum to do that. Oh, there's no question. I mean, you're absolutely yeah. right, Sarah. It's very expensive employing people and housing people in offices in central London. But of course, that's why over many decades, actually, there's been a, a gradual, in my view, too slow moving out of government departments to the, some of the regions. Uh, and in a sense, yeah. that, that's part of levelling up, isn't it? I would just like to see that happen uh, more quickly. But surely, Sarah, the thing is, for me, it's all about productivity. And my concern is that the productivity of uh, many elements of uh, the public sector has gone down despite people saying that productivity is the same or better working from home but we've seen the opposite if you want to get a passport or a driving license or a driving test good luck with that getting that promptly yeah but why do you think that that's about working from home because actually since i work from home i work twice as hard because right what you have to do is to produce the outputs when you're in the office you just need to be seen so no, that's, that, that, long... no i, I couldn't time. agree more sarah i want to see that but my concern is the outputs such as the time it takes to get a passport or the time it gets to get a driving test or a driving license, the numbers on that have shown that actually those uh, those waiting times have increased substantially during this this period of COVID when when most people have been working from home in the uh, in the civil service. Yeah, but is that a causal relationship? Maybe because because COVID has hit the civil service, the people are off sick. How do you know it's because people are working from home? Is why there's a reduction in in you know in people producing passports, etc. It's probably because of COVID. There's, you know, they're not bulletproof. People working for the government are also susceptible to COVID oh. and also susceptible to being sick as well. Or maybe it's the business model as to how they deliver it. But I can guarantee you it's not because people are working from home, because when you're working from home, it's twice as hard. I can guarantee you, because you've got to be on, you've got to be there at your computer. You've got to be there for your meetings. Whereas when you're in the office, you can swan around, you can have your coffee, you can put your coat on the back of the chair. And, so do you think, you know, so seriously, Sarah, do you think productivity has improved in the civil service since people are working from home? From my perspective, it certainly has. I really do. I mean, obviously, there are customer-facing roles. Most people haven't got a choice. They have to be you know, out there on the ground. They can't work from home. So you've got to, personally, you've got to separate that. Where are their customer-facing roles? They haven't had the luxury of being able to work from home. I'm lucky that I've got a, a support function role, you know, working with HR, et cetera, et cetera, which means that I can, I can work from home. I don't need to be customer-facing. I don't need to serve the public. But I certainly know from the work I'm doing and from the colleagues I'm working with that we are working, you know, from 8.30 till 6 o'clock. And believe me, I have a 20-minute lunch. 
I have a twenty because I know I've got to get back to commute because so, someone else is busting me, someone else has got me. Yeah. So, are you hoping to carry on working home five days a week, or will you do a, a sort of a mix and match, two or three days well, at home? Our, yeah, our company is looking to do a bit of hybrid, is what they're calling, where um, they're saying we're coming to the office two days a week, but we come to the office not just to sit there and and, and burn the real estate money, but you come into the office for a purpose. You're having a meeting. You need a face-to-face -face meeting. You're doing a brainstorm workshop. Et Indeed. Et no, I mean, I, I actually happen. think I think there is definitely uh, for many people, office-based people, the ability to get a win-win. You're in the office three days a week, sharing, creating, brainstorming, and then if you've got a report to write or something where you need a bit of quiet time, you can do that from home. But my concern, Sarah, is that the evidence across much of the public sector is too often working from home and COVID is used as an excuse. Uh, for, for, for waiting times to lengthen and lengthen. And we've got to get them back so that things work promptly, fast, uh, quickly and efficiently. Well, I think you've just got to get to the causal relationship as to why productivity is wrong. I don't think it's because people are working from home. Interesting. I OK, Sarah, it's... I, I yeah, get... Maybe... Oh, can no, I just say you... one other thing? Just uh, want to say one other thing. Just quickly. I think that we're subsidising the taxpayer, actually, by working from home, because I'm paying for the rent on my house. I'm no longer paying for the rent that you have to pay for the real estate in London. I'm paying for my excessive heating bill. And, I'm and Sarah, you, no, I take all that, and you're saving, but also, of course, you're not having to travel to the office, so you're saving money there. Um, Sarah, that's a fantastic defence of working from home. Call us, uh, tweet us, text us, send us a message. Do you agree with Sarah about working from home, or do you think people should get back to the office? 0344 499 1000. Brilliant defence from Sarah. I think the win-win is a mix and match. I don't think working from home full-time improves productivity. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk. It's Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Richard Tice on Talk Radio. A first magnitude star of common sense. The Tice Man. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. Richard Tice. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Tice Talk. And that call from Sarah in London has really lit up the switchboard and uh, the tweets coming in. Peter says, uh, w w working from home produ uh, improves better productivity. Sorry, can't agree with that. And Sam says, my experience of dealing with taxpayers, public sector for those that deal with the public uh, is not good. Uh, he was on the phone with HMRC 25 minutes before being answered, couldn't deal with the inquiry. Uh, after 45 minutes, ended the call and others besides. Uh, I think um, my own experience is, is that a win-win is where you can work from home if you're writing a report or something, but otherwise I think you've got to get into the office and, and share that creativity, that brainstorming. That, for me, feels right. And also, I think there's a, a social responsibility uh, to help the young uh, people coming into work uh, you're sort of freshly newly from university and things, they need the experience of understanding what goes on in the office, just, you know, how people uh, deal with things, sales pitches. That's how you learn. Uh, and you can't do that on Zoom working from home. So there's a sort of a moral and social responsibility for the older people uh, helping the young come on. Anyway, we need to move on. Keep the calls coming in. Uh, we'll be taking some calls later on because we're now joined by the Conservative MP for Wellingborough. Peter Bone, no less, to talk about COVID and, of course, what's going on in Westminster. We've had lots of differing views this morning. Some people saying, for heaven's sake, focus on the big issues of the day, and others saying, no, actually, this really is a matter of principle. Uh, Peter, a very good morning to you this Sunday. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining me. So um, where, where are we? There's so much to talk about. Uh, but We've got the Sue Gray report. Are we going to get that this week, Peter, do we think? Well, good morning, Richard. I, I guess so. Um, I don't see why it should be delayed. I, I, I think someone, the best guess is somewhere between Tuesday and Thursday. Um, bring it on as soon as possible so we can deal with the matter and move on. Indeed. And also there's the, the matter of the, um, shall I call it in inverted commas, pressure from whips in respect of MPs. I don't, I don't think in your illustrious parliamentary career, Peter, I'm not sure you've ever been a whip, but I'm sure you've had lots of pressure <laughs> it, um, put on you over the years. Um, where's the line between pressure and bullying stroke blackmail, Peter? In my early days, uh, that's, I, I was... Um, I was going to be considered for the whips office. And I understand that... Um, one of the whips blackballed me, uh, who's still in Parliament, actually. Um, but that was... Uh, it would it would have been a different career if I'd gone that way. I think I'm one of the most rebellious MPs in Parliament, and I've had, how do you say, robust exchanges with the whips. But the, I, I've never been... I mean, I've never been threatened with not having money for a hospital or... In fact, we've got a new hospital being built in my constituency, a new bypass been building my constituent myself and Philip Hollibone, if you look at the record, probably are the most rebellious MPs over the last uh, 10 years or so. So, but, um, but do you think that because of the challenges the Prime Minister is facing, that actually it's moved from robust exchanges to these threats about uh, funding for schools and things? I mean, do you think that's credible? No, I, I, I don't. I, I actually think whipping has become more... Um, sophisticated since I first came along. There were threats at the beginning when you first came along. You know, you're, you, you'll you remain on the back benches if you vote this way. Well, OK, I'm going to vote that way and remain on the back benches because I'm here as an MP to use my judgment. I'm not here to listen to some whips um, idea of how I should vote. I, I've always objected to the whips telling me how I should vote. And in fact, I think I had a private member's bill some time ago to abolish the whips department. Uh, so, but look, if you're an MP, and a whip comes up to you and says, this is not going to do your career any good if you if you vote that way. And then you change your vote in that. You're not worthy to be an MP. I mean, goodness me, of course the whips are going to try and get you and they use all sorts of arguments that invite you to go and see the minister Indeed. or whatever. It, but you, 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 you have to, if you're an MP, for goodness sake, stick up for... Well, you've your got to show some principal integrity. Yeah. Um, so, Peter, if we can move on, please, to uh, COVID restrictions. Obviously, Plan B restrictions have been lifted and thank heavens for that. Uh, but obviously there's still other restrictions that remain. There are still some schools that are demanding masks be worn. 
Um, and then there's the issue of testing, how long we're going to have uh, free testing and whether actually, I mean, I had uh, Dr. Clive Dix, the former chair of the Vaccine Task Force, saying we should stop all testing and treat it like flu. Uh, what do you see as the pace of, re of the removal of these remaining restrictions and we just treat this like some form of flu? Well, the sooner the better, in my view. I've been opposed to these restrictions. I think you should, people should just use common sense. So, for instance, if there was a very crowded pub, I might decide not, not to go into it, or I might decide the risk of going to a football match, I don't want to go. But leave it up to the individual. I don't want the state telling me how to run my life. And the real thing that I want to see dropped is the compulsory uh, vaccination of NHS staff, otherwise they get fired. I mean, I've never heard of a more stupid policy. Oh, it, it, it's, out, it's outrageous, and I'm talking to Alan Miller later this hour, Peter. And there is suggestions in some of the newspapers this morning, I think the Sunday Telegraph, that a deferral may be on the cards. Well, I, I just wonder if the whole point of this policy was to get more people to be vaccinated by threatening this and having no intention ever to do it. Uh, so it's, it's what they, I mean, almost called this silly nudge theory. You know, if you, you nudge someone to do it and then you... Uh, at the end, you withdraw the, the ultimate. Look, when you want more people in, in the NHS, how can you be threatening to fire 10% of the staff? I mean, it, it, it doesn't make any logical sense. There's always some people in government who want to control everything, but we're conservatives. That's, we, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be going along with that line, and that's just fun. If, if, if I could change one thing today, that's what I would do. I'd, I'd scrap that proposal. I, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, I, I think it's completely wrong... Uh, to mandate vaccination for anybody. Uh, but it's like doubly wrong to be, in a sense, compounding what's already happened, of course, with uh, people in the care sector, Peter, who've already lost their jobs. Um, you know, to be compounding this error. And, you know, there are more and more actually uh, brave frontline uh, medical staff, be they consultants, be they doctors or nurses, who are saying, these are the reasons why I've chosen not to, and it's and it's my choice. I've been working hard, uh, saving people, helping people, uh, and that's how you treat me by firing me. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I absolutely think people should be vaccinated, and I'd encourage people to do it. But I don't want people to be forced. Now, I've had all my three vaccinations. I had them all on time, and yes, I got COVID uh, after that. But then. I wasn't as seriously ill because of it. So I'd encourage people to do it, but I wouldn't force them to do it. Uh, fantastic. And Peter, just before we let you go, so uh, we get the Sue Gray report, uh, whatever it says. Uh, do you think Boris stays until May or beyond? I think Boris stays. I'll tell you why. Um, I've been out canvassing as we, we do on Fridays and Saturdays. Last Saturday, four hours. Friday, two hours. Two hours yesterday, two hours in the afternoon. The overwhelming majority of people on the ground don't even bring the issue up. They want us to deal with the big issues. I have to say there is a difference between what's happening in my constituency and what's happening in the Westminster village. Interesting. That's very interesting. Well, it's it's very split uh, in terms of the talk radio listeners, but uh, Peter, thank you very much thank for you. that. Uh, that was Peter Bone, a Conservative MP for Wellingborough, with his thoughts on accelerating the dropping of the COVID restrictions, getting rid of the uh, the mandate for vaccination for NHS staff. He thinks Boris stays and that we should be focusing on the big issues of the day. We're going to take Ruth in Faversham uh, is on the line. Ruth, good morning to you. Good morning, Richard. Lovely to speak to you. Nice. A a yeah, what would you like to say? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I head up a, an education service. Uh, we, we're based in Canterbury. We work across Kent and we work with probably some of the most vulnerable kids. Um, you know, it's really important that my staff see my kids face to face for safeguarding you know we know that there's been a, a terrible situation with kids uh, you know at risk and, and families not being supported and, and so on so really i want my staff in front of these children where they need to be and also my core team my top team needs to be in they need to be together i want them bouncing ideas off each other i want them supporting each other and, and, and working together and i just don't think you can do that from home and actually i mean I don't know, well, Sarah from, from London obviously works in HR, and maybe for her that works, but I've had absolutely appalling service from HMRC, from the DVLA, and various other government-run agencies, which, you know, again, don't try and book a meeting, you know, before 10 or after 4, and I've, I've done business with, with government in the past, and it was a nightmare. 
Um, you know, it's just, it, it's been atrocious. I, I've never seen anything like it. I don't think... All, all, the, evidence, all the evidence mm. I've seen in terms of the outputs, and you can measure it really clearly with things like the time it takes to get a passport or a driving test or a driving test, yeah. all those outputs, the, the numbers have been catastrophic. But actually the most important output in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, getting uh, the missing 100,000 children back to school, where have they gone in terms mm. of, uh, you know, protecting children from domestic abuse. Absolutely. Those are the most critical things. And, you know, Absolutely. for, for, for um, social workers not to be out uh, visiting and checking and supervising, for me, mm. uh, that's the most appalling amongst many appalling things. I absolutely agree. And, you know, how can we do our job? We're supposed to be removing barriers to learning. And, you know, that's very much what my organisation does. We, you know, whatever the barrier, we will find a way around it. We'll work with our kids and make this work. And, you know, I've, I've never supported masks. I don't want my son wearing a mask to school. Um, you know, I don't, I've never agreed with that. I wouldn't enforce that with my staff unless they want to. I mean, if they want to do that, that's up to them. But, you know, they're dirty, they're unhygienic, they don't work. Um, you know, there's no evidence to support them. And, you know, it's just another barrier for kids who are struggling. I and mean, this online learning doesn't work. And, I mean, and is, in, 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 um, don't say if you don't want to, but um, uh, the school where your son is going to and is, is learning at, uh, mm. have, they, have they lifted the mask mandate or not? Thank God, yes. But I had to be quite forceful with my views. And I don't want to not support my son's school. And I understand they're making difficult choices. But I had to be quite forthright. Um, and having done my research because of my own students, I know the legal stance on this. And, and as Julia Hartley Brewer quite rightly said a couple of weeks ago on her show, you know, she was talking about the fact that, you know, if it causes distress, that's a reason to to not have to wear it and you don't have to justify why you don't want to wear a mask all this For rubbish sure. this mandating is it's just it's a way of controlling people and people have become used to this authoritarian stance that the government has taken how dare they how dare they take these these measures to control people and, and reduce freedoms and i'm, I'm disgusted with boris and, and the conservative Quite. party and frankly you've got my vote well, that's so, very kind yeah. of you, Ruth. Um, thank you so much for uh, those you. thoughts. That was Ruth in Kent with her views uh, about uh, schooling masks, but also about productivity from working from home. We'll be taking your calls after we listen to Alan Miller from the Together Declaration about the NHS uh, vaccine mandate, which may be changing. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Talk Radio. Bold, brave, ballsy. Made to make your mouth water. A radiant force of argument. Shape up and talk. Freedom of speech. Accept no substitutes. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ties Talk. And we have got coming up at the top of the hour, we're going to be talking to Bill Browder, who ran significant business interests in Russia. He wrote an amazing book called Red Notice about it. If you haven't read it, please do. It's like a thriller, but it's true. And Bill, actually, his lawyer, sadly, was murdered uh, in one of the prisons in Russia uh, whilst he was investigating tax fraud. And Bill, actually, uh, he was the guy who proposed legislation that was passed in Congress, what's called the Magnitsky Act, named after his lawyer who did die in Russia's prisons. So he knows what Putin may be thinking and the impact that uh, whether or not he's going to invade Ukraine and the, the impact that'll have on, uh, for example, gas prices. So don't miss that. But meanwhile, we've now got a discussion with Alan Miller, the founder of the Together Declaration, to talk about the NHS vaccine mandate for staff, which may be shifting. Alan, a very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. So uh, there was obviously a big demonstration up and down, or demonstrations up and down the country yesterday, a big one in London, and I think that PPE, uh, PPE's sort of um, equipment and uh, nurses' um, uh, clothing, for example, uh, PPE equipment was actually uh, thrown onto the floor in front of Downing Street uh, as a sort of sign of protest. What are you hearing, Alan? Is, is it true the report, for example, in the Telegraph, the government might be considering a deferral of some sort? Yes, we've been hearing from for some time that there's uh, emergency discussions uh, that the cabinet and the government know that the uh, feedback from NHS CEOs from the 228 trusts in England are that they simply cannot cannot manage. There's 95,000 shortage already, with another loss of 126,000 plus additional um, ancillary workers. It's not feasible from a logistics and resource point of view. Also, I think they, it was a huge nudge, and they expected people just to fall in line. But the response and the reaction, it should also be noted that with the exception of the Workers of England Union, who have defended their members, is why so many people have gone to join them, m many of the unions have not defended their members and pushed this forward. Some have said that they've all said that they're um, opposed to a mandate, but actually it's been the bravery of ordinary NHS frontline staff who've done this for 23 months that took the initiative and said, we're not going to do this. And with Together Declaration and NHS 100K and many others, we've all stood together, as you say, up and down the country. It's now broken into the mainstream, this whole discussion. I think the government recognises that this was a nudge and a push too far. That's not how we should do things in Britain. We need to have discussions, informed decision making. And it really speaks to what's happened in the last 23 months, that the idea that you impose uh, and you use draconian measures rather than convince and win hearts and minds is an enormous problem. And not, um, only should we, not only should we see an end to this mandate, we have to remember the care workers, 60,000 of them. Well, that's away. right. That's right. They, they need to be reinstated. And we need to get back to treating the public seriously, where we engaged and have an open discussion where there's proper scrutiny. We don't have measures by stealth just imposed on us. And that's part of what I would say the next period is the winning of the peace. So I do think that it's going to, it's looking very much like it can be, they're saying paused or delayed. I would say ended, although we also are hearing murmurs of uh, a mandation for flu jabs. It's just to remind everyone in the government that in Britain, we're a free democratic society. If they may have forgotten some of that in this last period, but British people will insist upon it. It's paramount. It's, well, there's, there's, there's definitely change happening. And uh, even just whilst you've been on, uh, we've had a, a message in here from Jane who says, please thank Alan for all his hard work. You've been amazing. And you certainly have shifted the debate. Do you sense, Alan, that the change may come in the next week? Um, my, my instinct is if they do make this change, they'll start with a deferral. They'll probably say well, huge numbers have been nudged and they have taken the vaccine and therefore it's no longer an issue. I guess it, a deferral is easier from the government than a, rather than a U-turn. You know, the thing is, I think we need to remind the government as well that the spin is not helpful. People want honesty and people want transparency and the public have done amazing endeavours in, you know, doing what they thought would be the best thing to get us back to our uh, old normal. 
And we have this legacy, though, of treating us with contempt and disdain. And I really think that needs to end. And so they may well try to spin it however they do. I would in encourage them, and Boris should think about this, about having honesty and hold the line. There are obviously <laughs> various people. Well, I get that, but there are obviously as, people... As we, as we know, honesty in the Prime Minister is quite a tenuous link. <laughs> well, yeah, and the problem is, you see, is that people become very cynical. And what we need to do is get into a situation, and I really wouldn't remind any elected representative that honesty is really important. And when you make mistakes, say, I, I really genuinely, I'm sorry I've made a mistake, but also to engage honestly and openly. And the thing is, we're seeing a legacy of things in Wales, Scotland and Ireland where they're still imposing restrictions like vaccine passports. They need to go everywhere. Uh, 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 and, completely, uh, completely. Alan, I've just got to um, stop it there because I've just got to take a call before the top of the hour. Alan, thank you so much for your thoughts. You've you, done some brilliant work as my listeners are messaging in. And absolutely, the care workers who've lost their jobs do need to be reinstated because that is so vital. Uh, it really is. That was Alan Miller, the founder, co-founder of the Together Declaration. We've got Natasha in Wiltshire. Natasha, good morning. Hello, Richard. Hello. Hi. What would you like to say? OK, so um, the vaccine mandate... Um, my colleague and I have worked throughout the pandemic. So we were working in 2020 at the height of the vaccine, or when there were no vaccines. We were patient facing out in the community. Nobody caught it. We didn't get it. Um, my father, who's 98, was in and out of hospital during 2020. And um, for about six weeks, he never caught it. Uh, my sister's a nurse. She works in primary care. She's never had it. Now, I am vaccinated. I've, well, I've had two vaccines. I was very ill after the first one for two weeks and I will not have a booster. Right. Um, and I just think that what you're going to do if you force people to leave because they haven't been vaccinated is you are going to... The, the people that will suffer will be the population at large and patients. The, the patients, that's right. And sadly, we've already seen it with the care home workers who've already lost their jobs. Yes, absolutely. So um, when you've got highly intelligent people like Dr Steve James, the anaesthetist, who... Um, you know, you cannot get a more intelligent, reasoned man than him. An anaesthetist who deals with, you know, the respiratory system, who has worked in critical care, who has worked um, with COVID patients, is going to be sacked. He, he, I know, it's, it's outrageous. He made his own judgment. You have to trust that. Well, you see, if the government wants a way out of this without losing faith, I don't know why they will not antibody test. You know, that will be one step towards sort of saying, well, because the argument often given for, well, NHS staff have to have certain vaccines like hepatitis and um, tetanus. Those are long term tested vaccines. Now, I have no, well, I obviously haven't had any hesitation in having those by working in the NHS. But this is still an experimental drug. It might have been given to millions of people worldwide. But it's still under an experimental phase. And I do think to force people to have it is just it's, wrong. Well, I, I, th I think I feel it's wrong. It's just not the way we do things in this country. Uh, freedom of choice. Like you, I've been vaccinated, but it has to be freedom of choice. Um, that's fantastic. Natasha, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. Natasha in Wiltshire. And I think that's right. It is all about freedom of choice. And at the end of the day, as Natasha said, actually, it's the patient's in hospitals who will suffer most if there's a greater shortage of NHS staff. We've already seen in the care homes, it's wrong. They should get their jobs back and we should cancel the mandate for NHS staff to be vaccinated. Stay with us. Coming up, we're going to be talking to Bill Browder about Ukraine and the impact on geopolitics and on gas prices. It is, of course, Ty's Talk. It's Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Talk. Sunday Talk. Talk Radio. Richard Tice. Powered by debate. Sunday morning with the Tice Man. Richard Tice. The heart of a common sense Sunday. Richard Tice. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk, and time has been flying. I can't believe it. We're into the third hour of the show. Good afternoon if you're just joining. And also, if you haven't read a book called Red Notice, I've read it. Please do. It is, it is essential reading to understand about what goes on in Russia, about Putin. And it was written by my next guest, who I'm honoured to have on the show, Bill Browder, who wrote this book. He had significant business interests in Russia and... Tragically, his own lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, died at the hands of the Putin regime in a Russian prison. And Bill was significantly responsible for securing legislation in Congress in the US in 2012, uh, what became the, known as the Magnitsky Act, and then also similar uh, legislation uh, arriving here in the UK and being passed in 2018. Bill, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining at this extraordinary time when we've got the possibility of Russia invading Ukraine and all of the geopolitical implications that that may have, and indeed domestically. People, my listeners may say, well, what's that got to do with me sitting at home? But actually, of course, it could have very significant ramifications. Um, what's your sense, first of all, Bill? Do you think uh, that he's... He's going to invade for everything you're hearing and reading? <clears throat> well, uh, everything I he I'm hearing and reading is is like a big game of chicken. You know, uh, uh, I mean, well, let's just take a quick, a big step back so, it, so we put this all in context. W why is Vladimir Putin even doing this? Um, Vladimir Putin has been a dictator for 20 years in Russia. Um, uh, he's stolen an enormous amount of money from the Russian people. And um, after 20 years, people people get kind of tired, even if you've been a good dictator, but he hasn't been a particularly good one. He's been one stealing all this money. And and he's worried about being overthrown. And so what do you do if you're a dictator that's um, worried about your own people turning against you? Um, you create a foreign enemy. And this is not the first time he's done this. He, he did this in Georgia. He did this um, uh, in in uh, with Crimea. And... Um, and every time he does something like this, his approval ratings go up. And so this is a stay in power strategy focused on his domestic audience. So that, that, that is the first thing you need to think about is, is why is he doing this? So then you say to yourself, OK, we understand why he's doing this. Um, what, if he were actually to, to roll across the border um, with 100,000 troops into Ukraine, um, what would be the consequence of that? And, and the consequence would be um, that Ukraine would fight back very viciously. <clears throat> they might not um, stop the Russians, but they, could, they will certainly inflict, you know, grave casualties on Russian soldiers. And so the first major consequence is that uh, Russian soldiers will be going back uh, to Russia in coffins. And <clears throat> that's not a very, um, no, matter, no matter what you're doing, that, that's not a very um, uh, pleasant thing. And then the second consequence is is that there is a, um, a a lot of business interaction between Russia and the rest of the world, and that will almost certainly get shut down. There will be um, widespread economic sanctions imposed by the United States, by the UK, by the EU, which will cost Putin and Russia specifically a lot of money. And so he has to weigh up... Uh, you know, his objectives, which are staying in power with uh, a massive uh, cost of, of potentially losing a lot of people, um, uh, losing a lot of economics and having people be mad at him for that. And so I, I think, <clears throat> to, to come to your question, um, I think that he's playing a game of chicken right now. I think he is driving his car as fast as he can um, towards the Western car. Um, and he knows full well that he's in, in the most powerful position he's ever been in, where, where we have uh, gas prices are, are, have gone up a lot and they could go up further. Um, we're all recovering from COVID. Uh, we have all sorts of economic problems in the West. And he, and he knows that, that no, nobody has any appetite in the West um, for having any kind of problem. And so he's hoping that we're going to capitulate. We're going to give him what he wants. And in a sense, if we just pick up on that potential capitulation, I mean, there's, there's a real issue in terms of the division between, for example, Germany, 
who are, uh, they wouldn't let us uh, overfly their airspace to take weapons to Ukraine. Um, I'm, I'm reading that they've actually prevented Estonia selling weapons to Ukraine as a, uh, as essentially a co-NATO member. There's a potential here for real division. And you talk about a sanctions bill, and one of them is uh, the suggestion that Russia may be cut off from the SWIFT banking payment system, but that Germany might object to that. Well, so 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 Germany is a, is a real problem, and and by the way, one of the uh, one of the results of of this whole exercise he's already achieved, which is he wants to break up um, alliances. <laughs> so his idea of uh, I mean, so one of the things Putin hates more than anything is NATO. He hates the European Union. Um, he hates any large bloc that can cause him trouble, and NATO is kind of almost a a fiction, if you will, that says we're all going to. Defend each other if if the you know if the worst comes to the worst and he's already proven that that um, he can create his own divisions um, within NATO with with just just why, by what he's done with Germany and and so yes the divisions between allies is very stark there are some some people that are standing firm with Ukraine the United States the UK the UK just sent in uh, I think the UK is the largest supplier of weapons um, to Ukraine right now of anybody. Um, and, and in fairness, uh, just overnight, Liz Truss has released information which is extraordinary of what the uh, the Foreign Office clearly believe is a potential uh, puppet government uh, and actually named the individuals potentially concerned that um, that Liz Truss is suggesting that Putin wants to install in Ukraine. Yeah, it was, it was a remarkable story and, and totally plausible, which is that... that um, you know his his idea is to um, you know invade, bring in a, his own interim government of of you know what they Ukrainians who are loyal uh, loyal to Putin. He's got them all lined up. Um, there's a bunch of former prime ministers and members of parliament who who are currently living in Russia, who he plans to send back there um, if this whole thing is to come to what it's what it's going to be. But but I, I still don't think that at the end of the day. Putin needs to inflict the own these costs, these enormous costs on himself. He doesn't need to actually cross the border um, to get what he wants. So, so how much of it then, Bill, moving on to the impact on us here in the UK, how much of this, you talk about his domestic audience, uh, in a sense, if he can keep gas prices, global gas prices high by restricting supply and by playing these geopolitical games... Then, then that massively suits his book, doesn't it? Well, uh, I mean, gas prices already are high, and 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 he has been playing that game, and so uh, he doesn't need to do anything more to play that game. He, he's winning that game before he's even starting this whole thing. But what he does need to do is he needs to get he needs to show his people that he got us to buckle, and um and and in a certain way, we're playing right into his hands. All this hysteria about you know invasion and and the U.S. pulling the U.S. has announced that they're gonna pull out all non-essential um, staff from the embassy, all this kind of stuff, I think in a certain way feeds right into his hand of, of he's saying, you know, he's getting us all all to, to like um, uh, work ourselves into a frenzy um, and, and break up our divisions with our allies and then come up with some kind of capitulation. And it doesn't even have to be that big a capitulation. It just has to be something he can go back to the, uh, to his own people and say, look, you know, I'm the mighty Vladimir Putin. We're the strongest nation in the world. Um, everybody was standing against us, and they caved. That, and that's, I think, what his ultimate objective is, because he doesn't need the body bags coming back. No, he for sure. Need the sanctions. If if he does, if he does creep into Ukraine, and uh, in a sense, uh, it looks as though an invasion is happening. What impact do you think, with your sort of business experience, what what impact would that have on? commodity prices, gas prices, will they soar even further from their current almost record highs? Well, I mean, part of part of what he will do um, certainly would be to jack, you know, to, to, re to restrict um, more gas exports in the process just to mess with us. I mean, that, that, so you can even however it's going to play itself out. Um, that's one of his that's his trump card, really. I mean, that, that's the main thing he has that can affect us because most people around the world are going to say where's ukraine i don't even i don't even know where that country is but why is my gas bill going up and and that's what he's banking on is is uh you know people saying being very and and that would be an extremely short term thing to 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 think because 
you know, as he takes Ukraine, what's next? Is it Poland? You know, I mean, not that far to go for, to Germany. That I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, this guy is a, a malicious figure who, um, you know, is not too dissimilar to Stalin and Hitler and other types of people. He, he, his only way of, of operating is conquest, subjugation, um, totalitarianism, and, and so on. And if, if gas prices go higher from these levels, then the impact on Western economies, on, on, on Western people, on Western businesses, you know, we could be facing a, something equivalent to the sort of the energy crisis of the, of the 1970s. That's what, you know, what I'm really concerned about. And, and of course, that then gives him additional leverage, uh, particularly with Germany, to try and uh, get the new pipeline, the direct pipeline from Russia into Germany, what they call Nord Stream 2 open. Well, it, it, that's all very true. So he, he, he's got us by the short and curlies in the short term. Um, but just over the weekend, uh, the United States and the European Union um, were uh, having talks in Qatar, um, who is another major gas supplier, about um, uh, contingency plans, about um, diversifying. Because, I mean, it's not like Russia is the only producer of gas in the world. Um, they're a big producer, no, no doubt. But there's a lot of other producers who, who, in theory, if we had been foresightful enough about this 10 years ago, and I, I've been banging the drum for, for, for more than 10 years that, that you know, that, that, that he's a, Putin's a malign figure, we shouldn't depend ourselves on Russian gas, and we could have figured this out a long time ago. Um, but here we are with that, you know, it, it, it takes the plane crashing before you redesign it. <laughs> it it's so obvious. I mean, th this guy, Vladimir Putin, was playing games with gas a decade ago. He was cutting off gas a decade ago. And um, instead of cutting him off and, and diversifying, Germany has built a new pipeline to become more dependent on Russian gas. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it, to actually have increased your dependency. And, and many European countries, including Germany in particular, as I understand, they're dependent on 50% of their gas from Russia. So it's a, it's a catastrophic strategic exposure to him. It is, and, and and so if you want to know why Germany is not allowing um, us, Britain, to fly over Germany to provide defensive weapons um, to Ukraine, it's because they're scared that it's going to get real cold this winter and they're not going to have enough gas. And, and, and by the way, this is the only time that Putin really has this leverage. Once we get to the summer, he doesn't have it anymore. We're not going to be so worried about things getting cold. And and that that's why it's all coming to a head right now. And and that's why Germany is probably behind the scenes begging everyone else to capitulate to give him something to like you know promise him that 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 will withdraw our troops from uh from any nato country that will uh uh change the whole architecture of 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 nation states um to satisfy vladimir putin i'm sure that that's what they're saying behind the scenes well as, as you say in terms of sort of breaking up alliances and splitting alliances this potentially the division it creates between germany and other uh, European nations, other uh, NATO allies, uh, the EU. I mean, it, it's it's really significant, really dramatic. I, I think potentially the most dramatic uh, division that, that we've seen in decades, and it's costing, uh, you know, British people real money in their pockets with gas prices. It is, but there's 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 one simple solution to this, which which I'm um, I'm really amazed isn't the the front and center of this whole discussion, which is that. Vladimir Putin, um, over the last 20 years, has stolen from the Russian people $200 billion. And he doesn't keep that money in his own name. He keeps it in the name of his trusted oligarchs. And those oligarchs keep that money not in Russia, but in the West. And there's a piece of legislation which, as you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, I'm responsible for, called the Magnitsky Act, which allows us to freeze the assets um, uh, of, of, of human rights violators and people involved in malicious activity. And we, and we could easily put a stop to this whole thing by just making a list of the 50 oligarchs who hold Putin's assets and sanction five of them right now, today, and, and which, would be, which would freeze their assets around the world. And then say to Vladimir Putin, um, if those troops are not um, uh, moved back within a week, we're going to sanction five more. And, and by the way, this is, Putin, this is Putin's money that's being frozen. For sure, but why do you think Western nations are not doing that? I mean, we've got the right to do that. The U.S. has. Why are we not doing that if it's so simple, Bill? Um, because people don't seem to understand in, in leadership positions that they're, they're, they're everybody is 
uh, the, the, this, I, these are the worst poker players I've ever seen. You know, Putin has a pair of twos. We have a full house here, and we're not, and and we're going to be bluffed into folding. It's it's really it, it's remarkable to me when I when I watch the behavior of of uh, of of the leaders of of of. of Biden of, of, it's, it's, of the EU. It's, it's, it's remarkable to me that, that, that it, it's so easy to do. It, it is so targeted. It doesn't affect the Russian people. It doesn't affect us. And and my God, this guy, Vladimir Putin, if, if his own money was being frozen, all of a sudden he would stop everything. And and we've seen this before. That, that during In 2018, they sanctioned seven oligarchs um, connected to Putin um, for the um, messing around with the U.S. presidential elections. I'm sorry, it's 2017, not 2018. And it was like a neutron bomb going off over Moscow. It was the most powerful thing I've ever seen. And everything ground to a halt. And you know what? They didn't mess around in the 2020 election. This is so easy, so straightforward, so obvious. And so it's like... And, and, and so targeted so that nobody else is affected. So, so the evidence yeah. is there in terms of having done that before, but... <clears throat> But our leaders are not using that uh, that sanction, which is available to them. It's it's remarkable to me. They should be using that sanction. They should be using it, and telegraphing. You know, five. This we're going to do five today preemptively because you just because you put those guys at the border, and five more next week if you haven't moved them back from the border, and five more the week after that. And by the way, if you invade, we'll go for a full hundred. There we are, um, Bill. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, that's Bill Browder, the author of Red Notice. He knows how Putin thinks. He knows what drives Putin. And guess what? It's money. Yes, Putin wants to keep gas prices up, but also he doesn't want his money in Western bank accounts to be frozen. And so actually, if those sanctions were used under the Magnitsky Act, that would make a massive difference. Our leaders in the UK and in the US and elsewhere need to listen to the likes of Bill Browder. Coming up, we're going to be taking your calls 0344 499 1000. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk, Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot talk. Hot talk. Talk. Bold talk. Talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Radio. Starting with common sense. It's not all bad news. It's all radio. It's nappy. Without compromise or comparison. Radio you can't turn off because the switch is broken. You have a laugh, ain't you? Discuss. Debate. Deliver. Talk radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We're well into the third hour, and that was a fascinating discussion with Bill Browder, who understands how Putin thinks, what makes him tick, and ultimately, it's money. And uh, Joe Public has tweeted in, what a great insight from Bill. Do have him on again. We certainly will, because this story is going to run and run, and he's going to play uh, some serious leverage against us. And there's another tweet uh, here that's come in from Jan, who says, the only Western leader to foresee the energy crisis was Trump who made the USA fuel independent. Well, actually, it was pre-Trump that uh, the USA started uh, fracking with shale gas. And yes, they have become completely energy independent, which is why, guess what? Their gas prices are substantially lower than ours and elsewhere in Western Europe. We've got Sue from Chelmsford on the line. Sue, good afternoon to you. How are you doing? What would you like to say? Um, well, I wanted to talk about the use of our armed forces, and um, I mean, in, especially in line of the uh, geopolitical problems that Bill Browder was talking about. But at the last count, as I can remember, the, the army's driving lorries in this country to help the you know the driver shortage. It's providing the NHS with medics, and the navy is going to support border force, um, and the army has been dispatched to Ukraine to support the integrity of their border. Um, you know, how about our border for a start? But anyway, um, about 10% of the armed forces are still not vaccinated. And because they've deployed the unvaccinated sailors on shore, they're, they're threatening them with dismissal. Otherwise, they won't have enough sailors to... Um, to use against the, well, not against, but to control migrants coming from France. I hadn't heard that about the armed forces being required to be vaccinated, so I wasn't mm. aware of there, that. There is not a mandate, there is not a mandate, but they're being threatened with dismissal if they don't get vaccinated. Yeah, I hadn't heard that. That's interesting. Well, hopefully, if that is the case, then in the same way that the mandate for NHS staff looks like it's going to be deferred, uh, hopefully that will be the case uh, with the armed forces. Look, uh, you're quite right. The, in a sense, uh, the armed forces are being used in various ways. Um, but in a sense, very often when they are used, actually things happen a lot more efficiently and a lot faster. For example, it was the armed forces who had a massive role in the original uh, building of the Nightingale hospitals. They had a massive role in the logistic yeah. rollout of, of the, uh, the vaccines the first time around. And that's because they're competent, they're organised, they get stuff done, they've got a real make things happen, can do approach to life. I, I guess your it, point, Sue, is you're concerned they're being stretched too thinly. Well, it doesn't make, it doesn't say much for our public services, does it? Uh, well, it's a, you, that is a very, very good point. Um, why, why try to get them vaccinated now? Now, you know, when, when the vaccine actually is designed for the Delta variant, and we Omicron is now... Uh, you know, the most uh, prominent variant going round. Uh, what is the point of mandating well, when you've got such a serious thing going on in Ukraine? You, and, you've, you've got it anyway. I mean, the reality is uh, we're not going to have uh, significant boots on the ground in Ukraine, but we have been deploying weapons, and I think we will be up there in the lights in terms of trying to impose sanctions should he invade. Uh, thank you very much, Sue from Chelmsford, for your call. We've got Andrew in Halifax. Good, oh, afternoon, good afternoon, Andrew. Richard. What's on your good mind? Afternoon, well, um, I think what's on my mind, you have to excuse my voice, I've just got over a chest infection. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, it's the uh, Operation Destroy Boris that's been practised so blatantly by many in the mainstream media. Um, you know, anybody, I mean, despite the criticisms I have of Boris and despite my criticisms of this entire COVID strategy over two years, and I've been as vocal a critic as this as people like yourself, you'd have to be really stupid not to realise that this is a, an overwhelmingly London-based Remainer uh, media bubble that is using everything at its disposal to bring down a Prime Minister they didn't want who delivered a Brexit uh, that they didn't agree with. Uh, there's no question about that. So it sounds as though you'd like to leave him in place. But in, in reality, do you think... What do you, what do you think is most likely to happen after the Sue Gray report? Do you think people are going to give him a breather? Yes, I think, and I said this to Mike Graham the other day, I think uh, 
you know, the, the guy should be given a chance to turn away from some of the, the, the sort of crazy green rubbish that has been peddled over this last two years, uh, get to grips once and for all with this Northern Ireland protocol uh, and, uh, you know, v- uh, deliver on the manifesto that, that I and millions of others Well, that, voted that's for. right. My, my concern is that uh, on the green issues, Boris is absolutely boxed into a corner he's gone down the rabbit hole and Mm. if he stays i just don't see him coming back from that i think the northern ireland protocol i'm not actually sure he's going to be brave enough to do what probably needs to be done which is to invoke article 16 Uh, but you've obviously got a bit more confidence than i have well i mean to be honest i'm not sure uh the, the jury's out but i mean you know turning to northern ireland and this is where uh the hypocrisy of the media really shines through you may recall last july Sinn Féin, the most evil, despicable, blood-soaked movement in these islands, brought out no less than 5,000 acolytes onto the streets of West Belfast to pay homage to a dead terrorist. The stories about that barely left the Northern Ireland uh, media circle. They barely made it onto the front pages in London and in the rest of the UK. And yet here we are, a party if he can call it a party, and it's gone on and on. And I'm not excusing the party. There's no, there's no question. There's no question, Andrew, that the the, the media have uh, they've overplayed their hand on this, yeah. uh, without question. Um, and, and in a sense, there are much much more important challenges out there. But it's a question well, of standards and integrity. Andrew, um, we're going to have to go to the news. But thank you so much for your thoughts, Andrew, in Halifax. Stay with us. We're going to be talking more about furlough and other issues. Keep those calls coming in 0344 499 1000. It's Tice Talk. It's Talk Radio. Good talk. Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Richard Tice on Talk Radio. Common Sense Radio for common sense people. Talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. Richard Tice. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Tice Talk. We are in, unbelievably, the last half hour of the show. The tweets are pouring in. We've got one here from Andrew who says, Many companies and the armed forces are threatening their unvaccinated staff. That's why it's doubly important to ditch this call for forced vaccination in all settings. I think that is a really good point. And I've also had a tweet in from someone who is in the army currently and who says, we're told no vaccine, not deployable, not employable. Uh, they're doing it on the quiet. Uh, make, it's a sort of coercive policy. That is fascinating. So it does look as though, uh, in a sense, the army is... Uh, making it really difficult if you're not vaccinated. And I think it's right. We've got to not only just defer, but actually rescind the suggestion of mandatory vaccines. I was interested by uh, a comment from one doctor who said, in a sense, Omicron is so transmissible, uh, but it is much milder, it's actually like a vaccine in itself. Anyway, there we go. We've got to move on uh, back to actually where I started this morning's show, furlough. Yes, as you may have heard me, I'm outraged by the companies that have taken money, huge sums of money, and not given it back, but so impressed with those that voluntarily have given it back. And I'm delighted now to be joined by Louise Cooper, who is a financial analyst uh, who understands the city and finance companies and how things work there, just to talk about this a bit more, because it really is significant, and it's our cash, our taxpayers' money. Louise, a very good afternoon to you. Thanks for joining us. So... Um, I was talking about some of the uh, some of the companies, many of whom, Louise, are actually listed, like uh, like Foxtons, like Ladbrokes, who, understandably, in the first few months, like many many companies, you know, took furlough monies in order to sort of just see where things were at, what was going to happen. But actually, their businesses have done quite well. They're making significant profits, and so the big question really is, um, like those that have been voluntarily returning money should they be should should the likes of these companies uh, be returning it and and what's their reason not to so the first thing to say about furlough scheme is it was eye-wateringly expensive um 70 billion pounds uh in total which is a huge amount of money um and it's interesting because you're absolutely right. You've got Ladbrokes who had a fantastic uh, pandemic because everyone just moved online out of the betting shops. Um, and yet they claimed, as you said, 100 odd million in furlough payments. You've got Donald Trump, man, not, you know, not short of a few quid. He claimed 3.3 million in furlough. Um, Virgin Atlantic, Mr. Richard Branson, also a man not short of a few quid, and again, claiming a load of furlough. Um, and then on top of that, what else are these companies doing? Are they cutting dividends to shareholders? Are they continuing to pay their executive teams large amounts of money? Sadly, you will find that too often is the case. So. I think there is justifiable criticism for companies that have done very well, still making excellent profits, still paying their CEOs lots and lots of money, still paying large dividends to their shareholders. I think there's justifiable criticism. This was not what the furlough scheme was set up for. These are not the type of businesses that should be claiming. So I would definitely, on terms of a moral argument, I would say they should be paying it back. But unfortunately, that's not the legal situation. No, and you, you've, you've got uh, many companies that have, and I read out a list of some of the ones, and there'll be many more uh, that I'm not aware of that have returned money. And it's interesting, you take the likes of Ladbrokes, for example, big FTSE 100 business, part of a, a, a global business, but then you've got one of their competitors, William Hill, who took furlough in the early months, but then voluntarily chose to give it back. What do you think, Louise, is the sense of some of the shareholders in these listed companies that, that, that may own shares in the likes of Ladbrokes, the likes of Foxtons, the pressure that may come from, let's say, the pension funds on those businesses to do the right thing? Or, or actually, are they too, too focused on their own vested interest to receive the dividends sooner rather than later? So this is really interesting, like, 
um, in terms of corporate governance, that pressure from big institutional uh, funds, 10 years ago, I would have said they wouldn't have cared at all. But thanks to climate change, um, gender pay gap, there is much more focus and a generation that thinks if they're going to invest a load of money in a company, it should be done ethically, sustainably to, to do the world good. So I think the, the next generation of, of people saving in their pension funds will put a lot more pressure on those pension funds to make sure they use their vote to vote for something they think is good. So I think that pressure is increasing. Whether it's enough to actually cause those companies to change is another matter. So if you look at gambling, um, gambling is not an industry known for its morals. I'm afraid it's just not. The societal damage, the damage done to society from gambling, to children, to wives, generally this is tend to be a male problem, um, is, is catastrophic. So does it surprise me that a gambling firm will not hand back the furlough? No, it doesn't surprise me at all. So, so. But, but equally, you have got, for example, William Hill have given their yeah. money back. Um, but I, I guess, is, are you aware of any campaign, because some of these pension funds are represented by a sort of umbrella lobbying groups, is, is there any moves that you're aware of yet to, uh, to increase, uh, to ramp up the moral pressure on these companies? No, but then I'm not as close to the city as I used to be, to be fair. I mean, I imagine it will be a conversation they are having, but um, I don't think, I think, you know, executive pay whilst in a pandemic is probably a bigger issue, to be honest. And those pension funds, to be honest, they quite like keeping their dividends. Because <laughs> yeah. their dividends make their performance look good, right? So... So I, I I fear probably not. I think the generation the, the pressure is really going to come from the next generation saying we want our our money our our long term savings our pension funds to be invested and and the pressure I think comes far more from the individual indi you know person whose money is being invested than um, the sort of the sort of the, the fund managers per se because they're always worried and obsessed about their performance. And I wonder, you know, on, I didn't look at the day that William Hill announced it was paying back its furlough, but whether the share price went up or down, I think would be very telling. Interesting. But, uh, so actually what you talk about the individuals, but of course customers have purchasing power. And if the okay. customers decide to move their accounts from someone like Labrix to someone like William Hill or not to buy at JD Sports and to buy instead at Primark or something, maybe that might have more of an influence. It, I mean, it's possible. Um, I mean, again, I... You sound I mean, it's been interesting. Well, it's been interesting with Sports Direct, all the backlash there has been against Sports Direct and the way Mike Ashley runs his business. I think that probably has had an impact on his sales and his profits, actually, because uh, they have not been quite so successful in the last few years, five years, than before, you know, the minimum wage allegation in front of the, um, you know, the, the Treasury Select Committee or the, the MPs. So I think there is that consumer power. Um, whether it's enough to change the furlough scheme, I don't know. Uh, hard to tell, isn't it? Well, um, I'm thinking of uh, trying to uh, uh, ramp up the pressure. Maybe a few of us need to go to their annual general meetings and stand up and ask questions of the chief execs and the, uh, the chairperson because they don't like those sort of questions at those meetings, do they, Louise? No, all you've got to do is buy one share. That gives you the opportunity. Buy one share and then turn up and make, make your... Um, presence felt though unfortunately in the world of covid we haven't been able to go to annual general meetings they've tended to be ah. digital right and so again if they're digital they can control you a lot more they can decide whether or not to put your face on camera or not so well um let's yeah. let's see my listeners that's the uh, that's the answer if you buy one share then you're entitled to go to the agm i'm going to keep a very close eye on that i think they may find me turning up at various agms louise thank you so much for those thoughts on that that was louise cooper who knows a thing or two about how listed companies things big companies think and their pension funds fascinating give us a call 0344 499 1000 with your thoughts or keep tweeting it's ty's talk it's talk radio Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. 
Feds Archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Radio. They can take away your opinion. They can't take away your freedom of speech. 100% more beat. Smart people, smart thinking. We say what you think. Talk Radio, the home of common sense. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We're in the final segment of the show. It's been busy. It's been full on. And we were just talking about the furlough monies. I've got a real thing about this, a real bee in my bonnet about companies that should be voluntarily giving money back on furlough. Susan agrees. She says abs how absolutely outrageous that people who are, uh, she describes as filthy rich, were receiving millions of pounds through furlough. What was the government thinking in doing such a foolish thing? Well, I think the point was, initially, no one really knew what was going on. And we had to basically uh, protect people's jobs, otherwise we would have had an absolute catastrophe. So it was the right thing to do initially. Uh, arguably, it was a bit generous, and arguably it went on for way too long. But I do think that there should be some form of additional moral pressure now. And possibly it could be linked, um, as Louise was just inferring back then, to the repayment of dividends. You know, if a company can start paying dividends again back to shareholders, then maybe actually uh, it could start repaying taxpayers who actually uh, ensure that it was still in a good place to pay dividends. I just think we need a lot more pressure on this because it's our cash, it's taxpayers' cash. Uh, and anyway, let's now go to Carol in London. Good afternoon, Carol. What would you like to say? Hi, Richard. Um, just in response to your speaker about Putin and comparing him to Stalin, uh, who killed 9 million people, and Hitler, who gassed 6 million Jews, I think is really just ridiculous. And the second point is that you know, he mentioned uh, sanctions on the oligarchs, but the reality is, if you sanction those people, you're going to have the city of London, the law firms, investment firms, and New York banking, like, completely collapse, because these guys, they contribute a lot to our money supply. Hang, hang on, hang on. Seriously, Carol, are you suggesting yeah. that that uh, Russian oligarchs uh, yeah, who've, who've, who've got their money through, through uh, potentially... 
uh, they, they're either holding money on behalf of Putin yeah. or they've got it potentially through well, um, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. less than legal yeah. routes that, that they that we shouldn't get we shouldn't freeze their assets or we shouldn't ask Correct. them to take their money elsewhere because we're worried about how the city of London and, and New York might respond. That's absolutely what I'm saying. My next point is that the Ukrainian grain silos supply a majority, like a lot of our of the world's food supply. So I guess, you know, if Liz Truss wants to invade Russia or Ukraine... But of course she doesn't want to invade Russia. To no one's suggesting yeah, that, it's Carol. It's ridiculous, Richard. It's ridiculous. No I mean, one's suggesting Ukrainians that. You, you, to be you're being ridiculous, the Carol, suggesting that. Russian. The Ukrainians don't even like their own military. The Ukrainian military beat their own people. And, and, you know, Putin is not some sort of, like, like he's not Hitler, you know? I'm sorry, but we need to calm the situation down. And, and well, even, surely, the know, way to, the, surely the way for the situation to calm down is for mm -hmm. Putin to, uh, n to confirm that he's not going to invade Ukraine. I mean, it's not us well, that have been massing troops that. on the border. He's already said that, but if he wants to... And do you believe him? So -called, well, I mean, I, look... I don't think he's going to physically invade, but if he wants to install a so-called puppet government, I don't think that's a terrible idea, considering that... Hang on, it's, hang on, it's not, it's not his country. He can't just go around it's, installing they're puppets. They're Russians it's anyway. A, Ukraine okay. is... Okay, it's like saying Crimea is an independent. I mean, it's not, you know. Speak to, like, Ukrainians themselves. They will tell you that they actually like Putin. And then the other point is your friend, he went on about, you know, Russian collusion in the 2017 presidential U.S. election. That is complete fabrication. Like there's no, there was no collusion to, I mean, there was, you know, and then he's, and then he's it, saying. It, 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 it sounds to me, Carol, that you are, yeah, you, you are, you are clearly a big uh, Putin fan. Um, my view is clear. <laughs> Ukraine is a sovereign independent nation and I do not want. Be uh, that as I, it may. I do not want Rus Russian may, oligarchs. Um, you cannot start a war with Russia. You're going to lose we're, that we're not, war. Carol, we're not oh, starting a war with Russia. It's Russia that's threatening to invade a separate, sovereign, independent nation. Which what? they're probably not going to do anyway. All right. right? Well, I tell you what, I tell you what, Carol, we will carry on this conversation uh, in mm -hmm. a couple of weeks' time when we've seen what he has or has not done. Uh, I, find, uh, I find it uh, extraordinary that you seem to think that... Uh, we should allow um, Putin's money through oligarchs uh, to, to stay in the city of London and, and the idea that that sort of props it up and it would collapse otherwise, I think, uh, is not the case. I think that's complete and not a nonsense, but that's the joy. Everyone's entitled to their view. That was Carol. Meanwhile, we're going to head up to Chris in Lancashire to see what he thinks. Chris, good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, Richard. Uh, first of all, I'd say if I was... Um a bit older, maybe retired, and a little less stress with work, I'd probably stand for election for you in my constituency. Oh, bless you, Chris. Um, well, <laughs> I know, well, just too stressed. Uh, as I'll probably explain, because I'm, I'm a private dentist in the northwest of England, and I'd just like to say something about my experience over the over lockdown, because I'm I'm appalled. I mean, we're talking about working at home and the st and state funded uh, businesses, public sector businesses, but being on a different footing for two independent private sector businesses. And it was never more stark than the first week of lockdown when the chief medical officer, chief dental officer, in fact, did a massive Zoom call with all the dentists in the country who wanted to watch in. And the first thing she said was, I don't, I don't, I'm not responsible for private dentistry, which is the first thing I'd ever heard of that. She tells us what to do all the time. And the second thing was that the NHS people would get the same income as they had done for previous years, despite not going to work indefinitely until further notice. So the state-funded dentists were going to get all their gross income, um, no matter what. Um, right. And but you, you and the private sector weren't. Obviously, and the private sector were given no help because we're self-employed people. So even though we might employ nurses, hygienists, etc., receptionists, the business is a self-employed business as such, so we got no help whatsoever. We got furlough money for our staff. Um, some dentists... Um, even let their nurses go, which was against the law. Um, it, I, I spoke to the, uh, who happens to be in the same town as me, the lady who runs and administrates the Dental Nurses Association for the whole country, said so she was inundated with de and girls and dental nurses and stuff in tears because they'd been told they were on furlough, but actually they were being laid off. Um, so there were, there, were, there, were, there were nefarious things going on where people were getting gross income 
for their whole practice, and yet they were cutting their costs by letting people go. And, and, go, and what's the and, what's and, the and, and Chris, help us now. What's the what's the yeah. situation now in terms of uh, dentist waiting lists, people's ability to see a dentist? Well, it depends whether you are a patient of a private dentist or a dentist of an NHS dentist, and the variation in that is huge, because obviously dentistry and, and dentists who own practices vary in vary in their outlook greatly. Because we're all independent suppliers, even if we have an NHS contract, we're all independent suppliers, which yeah. is a whole different argument. Um, but um, the contracts with the NHS, as far as I know, because I'm, I'm not in, not really okay with it, but they have to do a certain percentage of their agreed work to get a certain percentage of their former former income. Now, that, um, I know that I know that practices near me, NHS practices, still aren't arranging for wow. routine. Checkups and examinations. Well, they they need to, Justin. That, that's shocking if they still aren't. Um, I'm just going to say one more call. Um, thank you so much, Chris in Lancashire, uh, who's a dentist for there. Justin in Sheffield. Uh, just got a, a, a minute or two. What uh, what would you like to say, Justin? Well, to be honest, I don't understand why there's all this fury over um, immigration and these these people coming over from France on the uh, you know over the channel. If they're prepared to take all that risk and put so much effort into coming here, I'm more than happy for them to come come uh, over here. Because I can tell you something now, immigrants are hard-working and more motivated than the people we already have living here. And I'll tell you something else. I would introduce, I would say to the French, you can send as many of them over here as you like, and we'll introduce a swap shop. And, you can have all our lazy benefit scroungers back. So, Justin, who's, and we'll who's, have all those hard-working immigrants. Uh, who's who's going to pay for them? Uh, where are the where are the G, Where's the capacity in the GP surgeries, the houses, right. the dentistries? Okay. Well, I can right. Um, I can you know stop you there, Richard, for a start, because I was talking to my uh, GP about this because we're having a big um, housing estate built near uh, near us, and there's quite a few people saying, "Oh, we're having we you know we're, we like have enough trouble getting into the um, you know doctors as we do now." And he said, no, you don't have to worry about that because for everyone who signs on for us, we get more money and we can oh, take brilliant. on Oh, brilliant. That's more great. That. And, and what about British citizens that can't get to say, see their GP at the moment and have to pay to go private? Wait, wait a minute. Did you actually hear what I said? I did. What I said was that if they have more patients signed up at a particular surgery, that surgery gets more money. This is what the doctor told me, and it, I know. it sounds reasonable, to employ more staff. But there's, yeah, but, but there's not enough staff to do so. Justin, we're out of time, uh, but thank you for that. There's Justin, who wants more immigration. Quite interesting. There we go. Meanwhile, we're joined in the studio by Bob Mills. Good afternoon. How I'll tell you, you what, sir? Richard, there's, there's this radio station summed up with that call. Here's a man phoning Richard Tyson saying, what's all the furore? And giving a perfectly reasonable point of view on that he firmly believes in. And you're saying, well, actually, there are other sides to that. That's what I like. That's there the are debate. other stations, I don't name them, but they operate out of London, uh, other stations where you would immediately get, you're talking rubbish, next caller. And it, and the fact that we don't do that, the fact no. that we say, yeah, I mean, OK. I, Let me just create you on one point. There isn't enough capacity in the surgery for a constant thing. It doesn't work like that. Surgeries can't expand. You can give them more money, but you can't make them bigger. Extraordinary. Yeah. But, but there we are. Um, everybody's entitled to their choice. And we've had a we've had a busy show. It's been all go. There's been loads of messages, loads of calls. What have you got coming up? Well, with? I've got Mr. Controversial, the artist, at the top of the show. Mark Watson, the comedian. And I've got... This has been filling my head for weeks. I've got the daughter of Peter Rimmer. No-one knows who Peter Rimmer is, but I'm addicted to his books. He's, he's been dead now many, many years. But his books keep coming out because he wrote a load before he died and his daughter releases wow. them, drip feeds them to, to the audience. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. And we finish with live music. Oh, fantastic. Well, that is a great show coming up. Well, you've been an amazing audience. And uh, we just got one last tweet here from Basil. Basil says, what about the charities, Richard? The RSPB were given uh, millions of pounds of taxpayer funding, uh, yet they furloughed their staff, leaving... Uh, leaving things not to be able to be done where well, they asked not to return this money. I'm going to keep on this issue. I think it's really important. It's taxpayers' money. My huge thanks to our great production team who've done, dealt with everything, kept on the straight and narrow. To all of you for listening and for watching. Come back next week. We're going to be talking next week more about the FA, whether or not they've replied to my request, and many other things. And COVID data, it's beginning to unravel. Thanks for being with us, listening to Ty's Talk on Talk Radio.
Good talk. Hot Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Sunday Talk. Talk Radio with Bob Mills. Guests, interviews, reviews, news, and everything. Powered by debate. Think big, think Bob Mills. On Talk Radio. Hello, 
and a very, very good Sunday afternoon to you. Thank you so much for Richard Tice for three hours of rip-roaring crackerjack wireless. Now, one while four, I'm Bob Mills and I'm with you. Let me explain what this show is. If you're a regular listener, you'll understand. If you're a new listener, thank you so much for joining us. You're very, very welcome at our table. This is the Oasis Show. We know that the world would have us believe that the furore, that was Justin Rich's last call, he used the word furore. Ten points for that, mate. The furore about the pandemic, the global pandemic and Brexit and the world economy and the Russians and the Chinese and what they're all up to is all anyone cares about. I have a slightly different point of view. I think people know about that and are interested in that, but what they actually care about is where can we see some brilliant art? What book can I read? Where can I listen to some fabulous music? Who's the guy who used to be in Dragnet and then they moved him onto another show and he was married to the woman who was once in uh, the Pruitts of Southampton? That's what I think people care about. So that's the kind of thing we deal with. Uh, you can call us on 03444991000 if you want to, if something crops up. We don't throw things out like, oh, what's the ugliest biscuit you've ever eaten? Give us a call. We don't get paid by the, by the phone uh, call, trust me. Uh, you can text uh, uh, the word talk and then your message to 87222. Or you can tweet at Talk Radio or at Bob Mills TT. But it all starts now. And I mentioned art for a particular reason because we have. Who am I? What now? Here's the thing, Stefan. <laughs> I didn't ask you what should I call you. Should you be Stefan? Well, or now should that you told be... the whole nation my real name. <laughs> <laughs> I'd it's be okay. no good. If I was a mate of Spider Man, he wouldn't last two minutes. Really. Just... Peter, what are we calling you? <laughs> no, I'm going to call you Mr. Controversial. Yeah, no. Or Mr. C. You Mr. Can C. It, yeah. And people could be imaginative of what's called me there. Right, Mr. <laughs> Con Mr. Controversial. And by the way, the guy's behind the guy, every time I say it, I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear a little bit now. That's some great beatboxing. Yeah, one. forget <laughs> it. Uh, so, Mr. Controversy, uh, I've spent the week since I saw your name uh, on, my, on my running order looking at your art. It's I like it. Thank you. That is uh, that is brilliant. Tell us about it. I was hoping you wasn't going to slate it <laughs> online. I imagine that. <laughs> what, what would that interview? Yeah, I'll be honest with you, pal. I, it's I, a bit. It's I a bit saw rubbish. the pictures. I don't think much on them. <laughs> Um, I like a, I like a pastoral scene. <laughs> they are yeah. a throwback, aren't yes. they? Yes, I'm definitely taking um, old vintage imagery, flipping it on its head, and making it more relatable for a, an audience of today. Right. Um, yeah. So they I mean. are the beautiful, slightly risque. Yes. It's a it's a it's a delicate blend between kind of being acceptable yet a bit offensive or yeah. a bit tongue-in-cheek and rude yeah and that's where the kind of name comes from it's it's kind of controversial concepts topics talking points it's funny it's relatable yeah. but then it's also against a backdrop of this beautiful 50s imagery the beautiful 50s women and uh and it yeah. and it was beautiful that is the word for it yeah because the women i think there is a beauty in in that kind of woman from that from that era women are always of course all women are beautiful but from that era when uh, barbara stanwick right if you don't oh, know no, you're too young there's too an right, actress called young. barbara stanwick who who wouldn't pass muster today she'd look far too homely in a bit <laughs> but she was she was a vamp she was one of these women who could who could dominate men yeah, I think what 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 I tried to bring out is that kind of empowerment and um, giving a, a, a kind of empowering voice to to kind of strong women who I've been raised what raised by, but also, you know, it's it's not about kind of sexualizing it; it's making it a bit more empowering, but still beautiful to to look at. So it's a it's a delicate blend what I play with. Do you get accused of sexualizing it? I don't because a lot of the stuff is. Um, it's, it's a kind of funny take on things that I overhear or it's the truths mm. within us, within men and women yeah. and relationships and what it means to, to, to be in a relationship in this digital age and all these sorts of things that are going on. And it's... Um, so, no, it, it, it's not. And, and a lot of my audience who love my work are, are women because they, they see the kind of empowerment in it yeah. and the funny, relatable topics, and that's what I do. Well, I love it. I love it whenever I see it. And it's, it's something that the, you can see a lot. You see it on, on posters. You see it on... There's a range of birthday cards where, where they take an old yeah. picture uh, and think, this is, what, this is what they thought they were thinking. Yeah. 
But I think they were probably thinking something different. Yeah, you know? I exactly. love that. I absolutely love that. It's like taking something and flipping it on its head yeah. and making it relatable. And, and so, you know, someone looks and think, oh, my God, that reminds me of my wife, my daughter, my mum, my son, my dad. And they're like, aha, that the aha moment. Yeah. That familiar yeah. So it very much reminds me of my mum, who's in her 90s now, uh, and might, might not even thank me for saying this, but in her 20s and 30s was a sensational-looking woman. Hmm. Right up until her fifties, you know, when I got to know her as a as a, a person, she was a super sensational looking woman who took ultra great care of herself and was part of a little posse of other women in the town where I grew up. There was sort of three or four of them who went out glammed up. Yeah, you know. But it's a, and it's about being a strong person, yeah. not just a female. You know, the new stuff I'm working on is is taking old fifties and sixties movie posters, that same look and feel recreating it through like old print methods and painting methods then i'm also working on a collection with kids books taking some of the old 70s kids books and flipping those on its head so the 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 kind of pulp fiction 50s stuff that i've been doing is what i'm known for but the stuff that i'm going to start bringing out is a totally different take on vintage imagery so where does this all come from where does it all start what did you, did you study art? No, so I studied film production. Um, quickly realised that I'd be pretty unemployable, so I ended up working in kind of advertising and a load of rubbish jobs for years, which I hated, and always wanted to do something special. I, I love kind of, you know, relatable moments when I see great advertising or something like that, and I wanted to use my creativity. Right, hang on, I want to go about. I want to know about the advertising. What? what yeah, advertising. it was kind of working for agencies, so it'd be like a branding agency or a social media agency. But I would be the guy that would sell in the concept, but would never be trusted to actually do it. <laughs> so it's quite ironic now that I'm a fine artist doing so well. So what sort of concepts? I want to know some. Yeah, so one of them was like a campaign for for Iceland barbecues and yeah. stuff like that. It's that same sort of making it taking something ordinary and making it relatable and i got sick of kind of selling off my ideas to people who didn't didn't appreciate them and i thought i just want to become an artist and i had this dream i had this vision and i've executed it and it's doing really well so i'm grateful. i have to say i'm going to stick with that world for a second though because there's a brilliant conversation to be had we've never done we must do that get someone from the world of advertising yeah. because i've worked in advertising from the point of view of doing voiceovers and doing, you know, adverts for things. And when you see the incredible, serious intensity of meetings about... Yeah, stuff so trivial. Oh. And you just think, what the hell? I, and that's I, exactly what I got sick of. I, I remember sitting in a room... I mean, no-one, by the way, does this better than uh, Tom Hanks when he talks about doing the voiceover for Toy Story. <laughs> And he says, you sit there, and behind the glass there are there are twelve guys in suits going, <laughs> mm, yeah, again, you know. But I I've sat in not in the meeting. I'm sitting there waiting. You just tell me what to say, and I'll say it. While grown ups have said, I don't know. I just yeah. There's something about when you're feeling down. It's just ridiculous. We don't want it? people to feel that, and don't use the word down. Yeah. When you I know, and uh, when I you're think, feeling suicidal, no, don't, don't use say it. that. <laughs> it, it, will, it will decrease sales. It, yeah, it's that sort of thing. So I think that's what's so brilliant about what you said is because I decided to take all of that and yeah. channel it into art and right. make something so that I can be authentic to to my worldview, what I think, my experience, and it all comes out through my art. So all that experience is... That's a great place to learn it, the world yeah. of advertising. I remember sitting in a meeting once at an advertising thing. Uh, I'm not... No, oh, no, I was behind the glass and I didn't know they could hear me. And I remember saying, why don't we just, why don't, why don't we just say, well, it, listen, it don't taste that nice, but it's cheaper than Coke. <laughs> <laughs> it was So it was for a soft drink. Yeah. Don't say that's nice, but it's cheaper than Coca-Cola. And looking through, and these people looking at me like, don't you ever, <laughs> don't you ever say that. Don't you ever say what we're thinking. Uh, yeah, and I think that's what I'm doing in the fine art world. I'm essentially trying to keep it real. Is oh, what excellent. I'm doing. And what's what it doing. like, the fine art world? Um, it's... it's um, it's a quite a quirky place. It's exciting. You know, you've got the emergence of this NFT stuff, which we were speaking about last week. Um... I'm doing a really exciting project um, on the 
on the exchange art, which is going to be cool. So watch out for that. What's exchange? Oh, it's well, like you've an got NFT marketplace and, a, oh, and an actual okay. ecosystem um, with the URS. So that's coming up. I'll be posting about that soon. But um, but it's it's an exciting world. Basically, you've got the archaic side, which is really kind of behind the times of fine art, and you've got this new and emerging scene in the art world. And it's how to merge it together and who really can figure out how to merge it together mm. and come out on top. So it's an exciting time. And, um, you know, I'm not from the art world. I'm coming from an outsider perspective and I'm figuring it out as I go along. Right, let's take a very quick break because uh, then we can go straight through then to the, to the end of it. Let's sell something. Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. The home of common sense. Permanent. Persuasive. Profound. The machine code of modern thinking. Now with 0% drift and dither. Radio with an answer for every bit. Talk radio. Oh, I like this music. Oh, if I ever get a cop show, that's the music I want playing, all right, in the background. It's Bob Mills, it's Talk Radio, and Mr. C, Mr. Controversial, and we're talking Hello. about the world of fine art, of which he is standing quite tall at yes, the moment. thank you. Doing quite well, isn't you? Yeah, a lot of it, you know, I started this with a dream of just becoming an artist, and, you know, it's grown and grown and grown. I've got an audience of people who love what I do, and 25 galleries and exciting projects. Now, it's how, how much of it is business? How yeah, much is, so, is art, work, and how much yeah, is it business? Yeah, I'm glad you touched on that, because I've got this thing that I call, like, the entrepreneur, and I think to cut through today... The entrepreneur. Yeah. There's a <laughs> lovely little... What they call portmanteau words. Yeah, that, that I'm going to copyright that. Yeah. Um, but I think today, any creative 
it's no longer good enough for you to spend hours and hours painting something and hope that someone will pick it up. Exactly. You've got to be aggressive and, you know, showing it to people, getting it out there, be confident and understand that art is your product and there's a whole business and marketing side behind that. And does that exist in the world of art? I, I, I have live music on the show, we all finished, and I've been amazed the last two years meeting the young kids who are like, A&R, man, record deals. No, yeah, no, mate, no mate. you don't need it. We, yeah. we, we make our albums, we drop them on Spotify. Yeah. And that's but it's, is there an artist is there an art version of that? It's beautiful that you say that because that's exactly what I'm doing. It was very kind of self sufficient, you know, I'm not gonna ask beg anyone to get my stuff out there. I'm gonna aggressively go out and do it myself and I've built kind of an audience around that and people are really resonating with the work. And, and there's you, like websites and things that is, well, is I, it online. I decided to put my energy into just my Instagram account and build out and okay. and I managed to sell out my first collection just through my Instagram account and it gave me momentum. Then it picked, I picked up a few galleries and linked up with a publisher. So it's, it's been a really interesting journey, but I think what I want to do is also empower other creatives to understand that you can take things into your own hands. We live in a world now where you can create your own art business, yeah. not just create something. Uh, that, that it's what I've learned from, from the music, the kids doing the music, but it must translate to everything. Yes, it's you know. a new generation of creatives, and yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm, I want to be, and I am a front runner of that. That's that's great. So, what what you're cutting out is uh, the meeting with the guy. Yeah, I mean, look, it's lovely if people in the industry recognise your work, but you know, having to grovel to to people to yeah. accept your work, no, we, you don't no. need to do that. If it's no. good enough and you've put the love and energy into it, people will resonate with it. But you have to get out there and and talk about it. Artists yeah. are so shy and introverted, and I'm I'm kind of the total opposite. That's where they're kind of... Well, it is. I mean, most artists, you would imagine, all they care about is creating the art. Yeah. Uh, and you think, well, yeah, but that's a bit of a waste. Because no one gets to see it. Exactly. It's that notion of the starving artist, and it's it, we're in a generation now where you can set up a social media page and run a business. It doesn't exist anymore, and it's a new generation of creatives, and I'm very much a part of that. And I think that's been the key to, to my momentum so far. Has, has this um, pandemic's had a lot to do with it, hasn't it? I think it has with the music. Thing. I think, it. you know, I, I was kind of doing this alongside a full-time job so for, yeah. for like a year and a bit. And it was the pandemic that showed me that I just want to, I just want to live a life that's fulfilling to me. Mm. And what would that be? And it's, I knew it was something creative. And I went all in with it. And I'm speaking to other people who have set up really interesting businesses yeah. and they were born out of the pandemic. Because basically the world said to you, yeah, what if there are no art galleries? Yeah. What if or, there are no exhibitions or yeah. concerts or anything like that? Or, then or what within, are you going to do? Within loads of industries, you know, a, a lot of the old systems are decaying and it's time to grow something new. That's why NFTs are really taking off. Um, when I launched my collection with the galleries, the first collection, it sold out and people weren't even able to go to galleries. Yeah. So it just shows that the buying behaviours, the way people perceive buying stuff, you know, if the work's good enough, there's platforms out there for you to, to put it out there. And hopefully where make where it can people see yours? Please, shameless plug, but if you can, Mr. Mr. Controversial.art is my Instagram page. Please pop in and say hello. I'm, I try and keep it real, down to earth, and I'll say hello back, and we can ch catch up on there. Um, I really appreciate it. Now, it is a fabulous thing. I've had this theory, you see, a terrible thing, that, that during the war, in a time of war, certain things, uh, medicine and technology, get a 20-year boost. Mm. You know, in the five years, the six years of the Second World War, medicine moved forward 25 years, because yeah. it had to. Yeah. Because it suddenly had these Ill injuries that they'd yeah. never come across. And... To a large extent, I think the pandemic's done that. Definitely. It's said to technology, you better get yourself sorted. Yeah, and people who are used to the old ways and old systems, you know, evolve or die, basically. Yeah, yeah. Basically, and and I like art is just one section of that that has to evolve or die, and what that breeds is a new generation of artists, and I'm, that's me. It's And it's fabulous, and it is progress. It, it is, is progress. Listen, we all lament things, but when people talk about, oh, the death of the high street... Well, it's up to the high street. Exactly. Whether it lives or dies. You exactly. Know? Yeah, but everyone goes on Amazon now. Yeah. All right, why? Yeah, and then, you you know, but power to small businesses. Yeah, you know, exactly. That, that top shop closes down, but then two other really unique 
startup coffee brands yeah. open up. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, it? I mean, I, well, I've had this conversation so many times. Oh yeah, but hang on, why would you go shop? Why would you just order on Amazon? Well, normally I'd agree with you, but there are two p- specific shops that I go to a lot because the people are so nice. Yes. And so knowledgeable. Yeah. And I can say to them, I was thinking of buying this, and they will say, "Yeah, Rosie, don't. It's not for you. This is what you know. That's the difference." We're so, living in a service age where you know service is utmost importance. It's not enough now to just stand behind the counter and yeah. take it and give them their money. Or like Amazon money. next day delivery. People yeah. want something more and that's you know, that's also within fine art as well. You need to build up a relationship with your collectors and people who are sure. interested in your art. Now, does that affect though the 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 kind of speed and the productivity that you have to I was Terribly, do you know what I was going to say then? Churn things out. I can't <laughs> no, believe okay. I was going to say that. You keep it real. It's but okay. no, to to produce. Produce, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, it, it is a challenge, and you know, I think what I what I'm going to do now is start releasing smaller collections and and try and not oversaturate things, but make really cool collections and just make them a bit more limited because you can get stuck as an artist just painting, yeah. painting, painting, and. I think I'm more about the concept and bringing that to life. And that's always the key. Whatever happens with technology, the 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 key with art is always keep them wanting more. Yeah, it? it's classic supply and demand yeah, if you yeah. think about it. But we've got like technology now that helps you, you know, make the most of it. Sure. Yeah. Who's hot then? You're hot. Who else? Who? What's sort of, um, uh, well, not not people so much as fields of of art. What's I, I saw this beautiful. They they came in and talked about it. This beautiful display at one of the galleries in town, where it was all about color. Yeah, it was all about we we've lived through the last two years. What people the, the galleries thing was very much people want color. Yeah. So our first thing is, whatever you're painting, we want to be able to see it. Yeah. You know, we don't want to go looking for it. It needs to jump out the screen at us. I think um, there's a there's a couple of artists that I really love. You know, Harlan Miller's one. Um, but then you've got like exciting artists in the NFT space, like Pierre Benjamin. He's doing some really cool stuff, quite tongue in cheek, controversial, like my stuff. Um, but what I really am excited about is the platforms that are evolving that help artists get their stuff yeah. out of there. Yeah. I think I'm very unique in the sense that I don't look to the art world for inspiration. In a sense, I can really care what the art world's doing or who who's making what. There's always going to be great stuff yeah. out there. It's about how do I make my stuff really unique and resonate, and and what are the kind of ecosystems that are being built to help creatives and get their work out there. I think that's that's my angle. <laughs> are you always thinking about what's next? I'm always thinking about what's next in terms of me and and what I want to yeah, produce. That's what like, I mean, yeah. I'm really excited by creating this um, take on old fashioned kids books and beautiful iconic movie posters and making my own and i think i've just got a i've got a tunnel mindset and tunnel vision and um i try not to allow myself to get distracted and and as i'm going through my tunnel i'm seeing these opportunities of like you know nfts and other things and galleries and come into my tunnel explain that just because people think why does he keep talking about the national oh. film theater <laughs> it's non non-fungible tokens non-fungible tokens Look, i mean everyone who talks about nfts is pretty much guessing at the moment so <laughs> let's keep it real. no one knows it's a it's a new marketplace it's an it's a new way of doing things but it's an exciting time a lot of people are, are investing in them but what it's doing is it's allowing people who haven't got access to galleries and stuff like that get their work out there and maybe make a living from their art, maybe become super rich, that's one thing. But it's, it's you know, it, it, as the crypto market evolves, I'm not one of those crypto guys, no. but as a crypto market evolves... The non-fungible got, will move You've got NFTs will move along and it's an exciting space for art. But then there's also great stuff going on in, you know, in the fine art world and, you know, some exciting projects that I'm going to be a part of as well. So, yeah. Now, is it, I find the whole thing absolutely fascinating because it's been far too of course art's a traditional world you know you go to a gallery you walk around you look at things yeah. and you think tell me about the art swap because someone was telling me about this other uh, a project where where you're standing looking at something you think oh, i'm not sure where you can think can i can i take that 
I don't even know about that. You you what, probably it, was, it was like, you no, know, you can't have that, but you can have a replica of that and put it there oh, God. and just live with it for a few days. I don't know, but that's it. the absurdity of the art world. Yeah, <laughs> but what's awesome. the art swap thing? I'm not sure. I'm not sure you got me there. Oh, all right. I thought Sorry. You, that was sort of the thing you'd been into. No. So it's the whole thing of art... What seems to me... All right, this is what seems to me outdated. The ones you bought a piece of art yeah. and you've got it on your wall, it just sits there and you think, I'm not sure about that anymore. Yeah, you just get bored of it after yeah. a while. <laughs> but Surely there should be a market for... Other than yeah, maybe yeah, like that. I see what you mean about. I mean, it, obviously, if you've got someone worth ten grand, find a gallery or come yeah. along. But if you've got some, I paid a grand for this, and I really don't like it. If that was a car, there's a million places yeah, where sell. people say, "Well, show it to us," and we'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there doesn't seem to be anything like that. Yeah, yeah. You have platforms where you can sell off your art and buy something different. I think it's just a. I think it's a bit of an exciting time. You know, you've got archaic systems like that of you buying art, hanging it in a gallery, which you know is really quiet or might be elitist or yeah. a bit pretentious but then you've got this other new exciting space in art where I'm in and it's like the, the small independent galleries and creating kind of controversial pieces and tongue in cheek pieces where are these and what are the good ones the the galleries yeah. um, so I work a lot with like Art Market um, Blue Fine Art um, Nova Fine Art so there's there's quite a few galleries that, that stop my work but just check me out on Instagram. I'm always posting stuff. There's always loads of loads of stuff going on. You're now the other thing is, and um, I hate to sully this moment with price taggery. Yeah, but what sort of money are we talking about? I I I set out trying to make this um, accessible. Um, not not saturated, but so my work sits at around kind of three k to two to three k. See, because I'm sorry, just to let you know where I'm coming from here. I'm a great believer that if you spend a little bit more, mm. you can get a million times better. Yeah, it's um. so my, you've got the prints that are, are kind of a, a more accessible price, but yeah. then the originals, the one-off pieces are like two to three K. Yeah. And they are one-off, so you can't buy them anywhere else. So I, what, I, what I set out to do is not make it like 10, 20, 30 grand. I want it to be accessible for people to, you know, be able to, to to get it if they really love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And that's me trying to keep it real. Well, people will, will... It amazes me what people will spend money on. Yeah. You know, I, I'm i sorry. I hope you're not listening, Ray. A mate of mine's just bought a sofa for four grand. And yeah. I think, they don't exist. Let's hope the dog doesn't chew. Yeah, there's no sofa, <laughs> I promise you. There is no seating experience that is worth more, more than a grand. A, for a grand's the top. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. just got a new sofa. It costs us twelve hundred pounds. It's yeah. not that. Comfortable. And I bet it's big. I bet it's, it's long. Big, yeah, but it's, it's not big. that comfortable. No. But I wouldn't spend four grand. No, exactly. <laughs> Whereas if you say to them, you see people come around and say, "Oh, that's nice. That's nice. How much you pay for that?" And I said, "Well, oh, it, it was two grand. Whoa, two grand on a picture. Well, you just said how much you liked it. Yeah. You know what? I could have got a print of it for six hundred quid. Yeah. But then." Uh, why wait? I'm going. Why would I wait and let those bits of money build up and get a, yeah. get an original? I think the thing is with my art, it is definitely going up in price as people kind of are investing in it more. But I've always set out to make it accessible. Yeah. But then you've got fine art that you could buy for fifty thousand pound, and that's the higher end of the yeah. art world. But um, I'm trying to sit in that kind of sweet spot where it's it's still affordable, not too cheap, but accessible and yeah. people value it. I'll tell you the key to it is the name they give you, right? Are you a collector? No, I'm not a collector. Yeah. I'm a buyer. I, yeah. I like it. Yeah, if I like it, like I'll buy it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, that's what, and that's what I like. And that's where, when people see my stuff in the gallery window, they, they're walking past and they stop. And I get these messages all the time. Oh, my God, I was walking around shopping and I saw your, I saw your thing in the window and I just said, I just have to have it. Is it reminded me of someone I yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. And that's, what, that's the magic for me. It yeah. doesn't matter how much it sells for. It's like, that's the magic. It's that it's touched someone that much who's out just shopping. Um, and that's the beauty. That's that's when you can really communicate with someone and, and the beauty of art for me. The great thing is you can see it when you're out shopping. Yeah. Rather than, we're going to go on a trip today to an art gallery. Yeah, so. and that that's the difference. It's yeah. like, how do you how do you capture someone who's just walking past living yeah. their life, who's re who it resonates with so much yeah. like that that they have to go in and buy it? It's just, That's the beauty of it for me. Not give, going to a kind of gallery... Give us the address again of the... Of the 
my Instagram page, yeah. Mr. Mr. Dot Controversial Dot Art is my Instagram page. Please um, get on there, see what you like. Say hello, mate. Mate, listen, make him an offer. <laughs> <laughs> no, just a nice comment would do. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much no, for giving up you, a your valuable Sunday Appreciate it. time to be with us. You listen to Bob Mills on Talk Radio. Good talk. 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 talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Weekend Talk. Talk Radio. World Headquarters of Common Sense. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. Talk Radio's Common Sense Weekend. Bob Mills on Talk Radio. Hi, welcome back. This is Bob Mills. This is Talk Radio. I'm just uh, checking uh, me tweets. You can call us on 03444991000. You can text the word TALK in your message to 87222. Or you can tweet at TALK Radio or at Bob Mills CT, which is the one I've got here uh, right in front of me. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Raymond. What are you on about, Mills? You ain't got a piece of art worth two grand. Yes, I have got some art worth two grand, all right? It's not a lot of money to pay for a really, really beautiful painting that you see, is it? Oh, you've changed. No, I haven't changed. I've always lived well beyond my means. That's why I've now had a, a pot for the <laughs> last 30 years. But anyway, thank you for joining in. Thank you for all your texts and tweets. Uh, if I notice them, I read them. If I'm not, I always do it after the show. I have a look through them and, and answer them. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Controversial, for giving us a, a, a wonderful look into the world of fine art. Which leads me to my next guest, who's a fine artist, be the art of writing, be the art of stand-up comedy, be the art of whatever. A say hello to Mark Watson. Hello, Mark. Hello, Bob. How are you? I'm very well. Are you well? Um, well, I woke up feeling a bit poorly this morning, and these days, of course, that always rings multiple uh, alarm bells. Um, but I, I don't have the virus, so I suppose by uh, by our definition these days, I am all right, yeah. So tell me how you felt a little bit unwell. See if I can help. Oh, just a bit, a bit fluey, a bit coldy, uh, very minor yeah, stuff. Yeah. But um, you just you think a lot more about symptoms these days, unfortunately, don't you? Do you know what I felt? I thought next time I talk to Mark, I must mention this. I have a great sympathy with you because we share a problem. All right, we share a problem. I don't know how serious the problem is with you, but but it's something we share. We both. This could, be, um, this could be any number of things, by the way, Bob. Yeah. I'm, I'm on tenterhooks here. Well, we both have siblings who aren't who people think they are, right? I, I've got a brother called Danny Mills, and people come up to me and start conversations about the football of Danny Mills, and I say, yeah, it's, that's not my brother. Yeah, it is, mate. It's on Wikipedia. Yeah. There are other people called Danny. It doesn't have to be just one Danny Mills in the world. And you have the same problem, don't you? Yeah, my sister's called Emma. Actually, the, the problem in theory should uh, recede now because she recently got married, right. and she's, she's uh, so she's changed her name. But uh, yeah, for most of thirty years, she's been called Emma Watson, and uh, for a lot of that, I mean, when she was born, of course, that was a uh, an innocuous name to have. It but then absolutely nothing. Emma yes, Watson. it was fine. And also, um, I think the problem isn't so much for them because my brother. If you ever see my brother, it's obviously he's not a footballer. He's not Danny Mills. Before, <laughs> but it's it's the reflected problem of your your sister. She earns, she must earn a fortune, must she? And then Harry Potter, and it's like... yeah. When the Harry Potter films really started becoming a phenomenon, people would sometimes 
occasionally send me messages on Facebook trying to use me to sort of get uh, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> she was. And sometimes they'd even find a way to get at her on Facebook and uh, they wouldn't at any point think it was strange that Emma Watson was so readily available. <laughs> but yeah, I think it has been um, sort of a pain in the ass for both of us. There's also a sort of, yeah, probably slightly diminishing thing for your ego where you have to go through your life saying, no, not that, Emma Watson, as if you're not the, not the genuine article or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, by um, the way, yes. By the way, I am the actual Bob Mills, but no, the, the, he's not my brother. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like to think I'm the actual Mark Watson, yeah. but there's a fair few out there. Uh, I don't even have Watson, uh, Mark Watson, on Twitter. I had to get Watson comedian because there's a bloke who got there first. Um, I used to talk about this on stage. There was a guy called Mark Watson. I don't know if he's still out there. It's about ten years ago, but he had one of the world's largest collections of stick insects. And um, occasionally, I'd get an email about about stick insect care and maintenance. And again, I'd have to say, I mean, not to do that area of wisdom down, but it's a bad moment when you don't even think you're more famous than a bloke whose thing is yeah. uh, sort of answering stick insect uh, yeah, queries. Yeah, because you but think then, that's got to be a niche fame. But on the other hand, once I was on the phone um, to the bank, uh, to a helpline about something probably fairly sensitive, like credit cards mm. ordering in you or something, and and the person did say, oh, I don't suppose you're that Mark Watson, uh, as in me, the actual. So there, there are times when you'd rather uh, keep it as a generic name. Actually, <laughs> I, I could hear the surprise in their voice that my bank balance was quite a lot less than they imagined someone <laughs> on the uh, would have. It's a new no. thing in life, basically. The people you want to recognise, you don't, and the other way around. Yeah, <laughs> it's a horrible moment. I've had the, a couple of those horrible moments where they look at you and think, but hang on, I thought you had your own... It's strange that you should be so short of ready credit. <laughs> yeah, I think people um, tend to imagine that if you've if you've ever been on TV or in the media or if yeah. they've ever heard of you, then you, you must be a millionaire, yeah. basically. Uh, or yeah. especially, and especially, well... Over the past couple of years, for live entertainers, that's um, yeah. been a pretty hard thing to live up to. But even before that, people... Uh, I mean, of course, I'm not complaining. I'm very fortunate to make a, a living doing this. But um, there is this... Is a bit like with footballers, where, the, you know, it, at Premier League level, it is insane money. But then people sort of scream at League Two footballers that they're also billionaires. Yeah. And you know, some of those will be car salesmen in a few years' time. Yeah. But I think people's... Um, and, 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 sorry, and earning a better living as a car salesman very likely yeah. yeah yeah the amount of people in any field who are actually loaded is always quite small but it is fairly easy for people to sort of glimpse someone on tv and think oh he's doing right, all right. well so, yeah here's an act an absolute case in point a couple of years ago me and tim clark were sitting in this studio uh, it was a late quite a late night show and we were talking about uh comics and money and somebody phoned up about uh, yeah yeah but the money the money they earn and we issued a challenge and we said, all right, here we go. Let's take, for example, a club that you probably all know, which is the Comedy Store. The Comedy Store in London does four shows, two on a Friday, two on a Saturday. Uh, if I'm, if you're doing a weekend at the Comedy Store, so that's two shows on a Friday, two shows on a Saturday, how much, seriously, how much do you think that that comic would earn? And, oh, man alive. It was wonderful. It went from, yeah. well, it's probably it's probably five hundred a show, up to, but, but my favourite was was well probably the people who go on first they probably earn like five hundred a show, but when you get in the second half people off the telly that's what's that probably two or three grand a show, <laughs> for the comedy store. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's. Um, even that 500 quid for the first act is, as you'll know, Bob, yeah. on the generous side as an estimate <laughs> to say the absolute least of it. Yeah, this is the thing. And even TV doesn't, you know, doesn't necessarily pay no. as much as people imagine. It, it certainly works out. And like most of us earn our living by touring, but by trying to do, you know, theatre tours. And even then, of course, it's quite... And again, I'm not complaining. Um, I'm, again, I feel lucky. But it is quite easy for people to add up how much the ticket costs and think that you're getting 100% of that. Yeah. When, oh, of course, yeah. A very, very large number of factors yeah. influence how much money, yeah. money you make. F 15 quid a ticket, I've been there, this, that, that holds a 1,000 people. Wow, wow. Who wouldn't want to get 15 grand for a night's work? <laughs> yeah. And that, sure enough, there are comedians earning that, but there are also uh, those of us who are sort of uh, <laughs> scratching around it a little bit more. <laughs> right, listen, we're going to have a very, very quick break. Don't go anywhere. 
The UK's official opinion exchange. Captivating. Campaigning. Controversial. Reach for the story. Radio with grown-up opinions. Don't get angry. Get on talk radio. The home of common sense. Hi, welcome back. This is Bob Mills. This is Talk Radio. You're listening to the Oasis Show, One Wild Four. OK, where well, we don't even... We pay no heed at all to pandemics or conspiracy theories or what the Russians or the Chinese or any of those people are doing. We talk about what I believe people really care about, which is uh, who's got a new book out, where can they go and see a nice painting, and who's out there on the uh, touring circuit. And Mark Watson is my very special guest. I'm looking at this date sheet and thinking... Substantial, he, isn't it? Has he fallen out with his agent? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh... Wow! The tour, the tour date sheet almost could be a novel in itself, actually. It would take somebody um, the best part of a day to read through all the dates. Yeah. Well, of course, Bob, it's because um, so much was cancelled last year that I'm basically doing... Uh, uh, I'm clearing a backlog of shows, which is... Now, now are you managing to do that? Because this is something I discovered last year, which, which of course, because I'm not, I don't know a lot about anything, really. And I spoke to someone uh, at one of the theatres that... that I forget which one it was, but I said, so the problem is, of course, you know, when these you, this show can't be on, so what, what, when will they be on? Will they be on next year as soon as you open? And they were like, no, nah, they've missed their slot. Well, th this is the thing. Um, we tried very hard to rearrange um, all the shows into future dates. Then, of course, a lot of them had to be, uh, you know, rearranged again. There was this ridiculous dance of having to put them into the future and then the future again. Um, and so when when theatres had to 
finally start committing to dates this year, I just grabbed, like all comedians, I just grabbed anything that Grab was Grab what you can, yeah. Which is all very well, but that does mean I think I've got 98 in there. <laughs> There's an awful lot. I've only got the... I haven't even got the, the full lot here. I've just got... Well, like a... I say, no human does have the full lot. You, there are scientists trying to work out exactly <laughs> how long the going to be as we speak. Um, I can only tell you that I was in Wolverhampton last night and I'm in Leek in Staffordshire tonight, and you just go from there. Oh, wow. So you're in Leek tonight, the Foxlow Arts Centre. Yeah, Leek is one of several places on the tour that a lot of people don't recognise as a place, and they, they, it just appears to be a random word on the tour sheet, but I can assure you they are all places. Well, I don't know. can I add my two penneth to that particular thing, then? Exactly that. Pocklington Arts Centre. If, uh, if you don't know Pocklington, it is... Right, imagine... Um, a starving man crawling across a desert in Yorkshire and just being on country lanes and nothing at all and thinking, I need some art, I need some... And suddenly, out of nowhere, the town of Pocklington appears. It's, it's very pretty, isn't it? Uh, and it's got the most vibrant art set, set up you've ever come. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, there are these pockets of Yorkshire, like Hebden Bridge is another one, yeah. where... As you say, in the middle of the dales and out of nowhere, there is just this sort of... Uh, and Pocketon's got a lovely arts. It's sort of not far from York, as its nearest... Uh, yes. Nearest uh, notable habitation. Um, yeah, that's one I've been to several times. That's the thing I do... I, I've been touring it as long as I have. You do get very loyal to these... Yeah. Um, small, out-of-the-way, beautiful arts theatres. And in this country, we do have a, a hell of a lot of them. It's easy to just tour sort of the big boys, but there's, there's so many beautiful places in between, as you say, which uh, sometimes, uh, as you also say, sometimes you... You're driving on the way there and you think there's absolutely no one <laughs> yeah. and I haven't seen it a person for half an hour who's going to come to this show yeah. like these are, I remember old... I remember going there and thinking after about because uh, the thing is in this country you go up and down motorways you go up down and across motorways and then when you come off a motorway you oh. just think oh well I must be nearly there now because I'm yeah. not on the motorway anymore but in Pocklington you leave the motorway and 20 minutes later, do you think in Jeff White is playing a cruel trick on me? There's, there's yeah, nothing there's here. Been plenty of venues I've got to where until I actually saw the theatre, I thought I refused to believe that that this is a real place. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, a lot of these places really suffered during the um, oh, God. during the closures. And so it's even more important to me now to to try and uh, get people out to them and support them. Obviously, it's for my own good as well. But I do also really want to see these places thrive now. How are you, how are you finding the audiences? It's been genuinely really fun. I, I, I think there's still... Uh, I mean, the audience numbers are pretty much back to where they were, I'd say, before. Some people are still more, you know, cautious about coming out. But uh, sales have been good. But in terms of the atmospheres, I do think there's a bit of an edge to the shows that there maybe wasn't before because we've all been uh, deprived of it for so long. So there's a, on my side and on audience's side, there's a little bit of more gratitude about, yes. like, just thank God we can actually do yes. this. I don't think I ever took it for granted, but... Um, Nothing sharpens your appetite like having to sit in one room for a year and a half, not doing the main thing you do with your life. And and is this a tour that was written before the pandemic? A lot of it was, but obviously, because of the way things have changed, sure. I've had to sort of keep updating the show. But yeah, so some of it is stuff which was ready to go nearly two years ago, and then other stuff I've sort of come up with along the way. So it's a sort of record of all my thoughts just before during and hopefully after the, the pandemic. But has, has your, uh, is what you've found, because I've spoken to a few comics about this, that in fact they don't want too much pandemic stuff. For sure. You know. uh, yeah, I, I think most of us, including me, the tactic is to sort of uh, acknowledge it. I've got a few jokes about it and stories from it yeah. and then draw a line under it, basically. And most of the show does do that, I think, because, yeah, uh, it's, it's a weird one. It would be a bit strange to deny like acts if it didn't happen altogether, but also uh, people aren't coming to the theatre to think about the stuff which has been weighing us down for the past 18 months. So mostly I'm trying to provide an escape from that rather than a reminder of it. OK, we've got some infotainment now because what we're going to do is we're going to give people some of the places that you're playing, OK? <laughs> but to make it more entertaining, I'm going to tell you where it is and you're going to tell me the name of the, the theatre, OK? I thought this was going to be the game, all right. Saturday see. the 19th, you're in Ivy Bridge at... Uh, the watermark. Oh, that was that was a banker for me. I thought you'd never remember the watermark. I do keep an eye on my own tour dates, but I, I must say I don't have them in front of me. I'm not cheating here. No, I'm just, sure you're not. Remember. Friday the fourth, you're in Crawley at. 
Oh, the whore. The whore. Yeah. That's a lovely, lovely thing. Uh, there's someone here that, that, he, that I didn't know, so here we go. In Scunthorpe on Wednesday the 1st, the theatre dedicated to... Oh, now, is that called the, the Plowright? Yes, it? it's because Joan Plowright is a Scunthorpe lass. That's right. I have not been there before, and this show was originally uh, on last year, and I think it was rescheduled because uh, with the best will in the world, not that many people in Scunthorpe wanted to see me, but hopefully times might have changed. <laughs> oh, they will. Of course they will. You'll be very... Scunthorpe... You see, Scunthorpe always think of... Because of the name... People always think of it as being very Yorkshire and oh, a bit like that, but it's not. It's Lincolnshire, actually, Scunthorpe, it's isn't it? It's got a reasonably strong word within it. You're right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's um. It is that is one of relatively few places that I've never been on tour, so I am looking forward to finally seeing Scunthorpe with my own eyes. And how much or how little um, political intrigue are you going to do on Thursday the tenth at the Whitham? The Whitham. Yeah. Well, no, I can't think. I can't think where that is. Hang on, that <laughs> is in, be a clue. That's in Barnard Castle. Ah, oh, of course, of course, I'd forgotten it was called that. I've been there several times as well. Uh, I imagine there's nothing the people of Barnard Castle are more sick of than uh, <laughs> yeah. people making jokes about that one thing. Yeah. Can you imagine living in Barnard Castle now? Yeah, I, I think it might be like uh, there's a thing where uh, there's. If you play Windsor, people are, you know, oh, of dozens of comedians all starting with, oh, how posh, you must be so posh, you must be, do you know the Queen? Or, or Tunbridge Wells is another one. There are certain places where <laughs> generations of comics have all thought they were the first person to make this observation. So I try to steer clear of that stuff. I, um, I'll do my absolute best not to touch on e any events that happened in Barnard Castle. Right, how's the writing going? Have you, yeah, more, have you mean, got more novels coming? I'm halfway through a new one now, yeah, or halfway through a first draft at least. And um, I'm staring at it now on the other half of the screen from you, in fact, Bob. Um, and, yeah, I think it's going to be good. I hope so. I've got to deliver it quite soon. Um, it, it is set in the past couple of years. It's not about the pandemic, but it's, you've got a choice to either do that or just set every book in the past forever now. Um, so I'm trying to write something which can, you know, we've seen with TV shows like Netflix and series and stuff, some of them have incorporated it a bit and a lot of them have just put themselves in a parallel universe where yeah. it never happened. Um, I, I'm trying to... It's set in London now. As I say, it's not really very, very little reference to the pandemic, but I feel like it's set last summer, basically. Um, are you uh, are you like me, someone who thinks... That I'll, obviously, I'll be... I'll, I pray for the day when this is all behind us and there is no... Uh, you know, the pandemic is gone and we've learned to cope with the world. However, I hope some things stay, like the netflix and amazon and prime and them making their own program because some of them have been absolutely banging yeah i mean there's been a lot of creativity in very difficult circumstances and uh you know like with anything it's hard to know whether all that will just go out the window or whether we'll keep you know trying to learn incorporate some of the lessons of the uh, we definitely learned a lot about how you can do stuff online and you know how you can work with people collaboratively across the world, and so there's definitely there's positives that come out of it for the for the creative fields. I think. Well, um, I know I've spoken, sorry, to a couple of theatre owners the last few weeks, and said, surely, you, you know, the money, the, the 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 income stream from Zoom shows, when you've got them back live, there's going to be a great temptation, and apparently it's all down to equity in the unions and whether they can, you know, they can do that. But they've, you know, they've been surviving a lot of theatres on actually having the show without the audience and, yeah. and zooming it online. And they're going to, you know, they're not going to want to give that up. No, I would hope not, because I think there's a whole audience that that reaches as well of people who can't get out yeah. or can't afford it or, you know, people with young children can't get childcare. I think a lot of people have... I've definitely found that I've built up a new kind of community and audience of people that responded differently to online. And, yeah, it, the trouble is theatre is quite... Uh, or some aspects of theatre are, you know, quite conservative. And there is this temptation to think, right, all that fuss is over, go back to doing it exactly the way we were before. But I think you need both. I think you want to be... Of course, we all want to be back in the... I love being back in the theatres, but I do think theatres could be doing a lot more to make things accessible, streaming stuff. And as you say, there's another potential income stream in it for them sure. as well. Sure. All right, well, listen. Oh, by the way, sorry, have we, uh, we haven't got time to talk about it, but I, I've I really enjoyed the book... Um, and you'll forgive me for not remembering the name because I don't remember people's name most of the time. The guy, the suicide guy. Uh, yeah, Contact, that was cool. We had a bit of a chat about that That last was time. a fabulous yeah. book. Oh, thank you. It was well, really I mean... fabulous. If this one is 
is anything like as good as that, then then I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I really hope it will be. It'll be not till next year, but uh, I'm well. I'm writing it as fast as I can. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll ask you one more quick favour, Mark. Um, we like to have really big names on the show. Can you have a chat with your sister? I, I'll see. I'll see if Emma's available. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you denying it? Danny Mills, he was a good player. He said, shut up, leave me alone. It's on Wikipedia, mate. <laughs> Mark, lovely to talk to you. Love to the family and keep yourourself safe. You too, Bob, as always. Tour. Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Bye -bye. Mark Watson. There you go. You're listening to Bob Mills. You're listening to Talk Radio. Uh, stick with us. Sack now of the show. Oh, it gets even better. Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. Talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Sunday Talk. Brilliant Talk. Talk Radio. Sunday Afternoons with Bob Mills. The heart of a common sense Sunday. Powered by debate. Full flavour weekend radio. Bob Mills on Talk Radio. Uh. Hi, welcome back. This is Bob Mills. This is Talk Radio. And this is the guest that I've been looking forward to. I've been blurbing on about for, for months. Um, I, I, right, OK, we'll, 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 we'll talk about this. Heather, let's say hello to Heather Stretch. Hello, first, Heather, Who is the daughter of Peter Rimmer. That's correct. Right. About three or four months ago, I started ranting on on this programme about Peter <laughs> Rimmer, OK? And... Uh, I kept saying, you've got to read these books, Peter Rimmer, and people said, what are they called, what are they called? And I was just throwing them out. And then I said to people, um, we need to get someone on about these books. And they said, we can't find Peter Rimmer's thing. I said, no, Peter Rimmer's no longer with us, apparently. That's correct. He, uh, unfortunately, he passed away. But his daughter, I said, I've looked into it, and his daughter handled it, and you must try and get her. But I think she's in Portugal or South America or something like that. But And they said, well, we can't really get anyone from Portugal. And, and, and it became... Because I became quite addicted. Great. Is the thing. That's good to hear. Over the last six months to these Peter Rimmer, the Brigginshaw Chronicles. That's correct. What we're talking about. Yeah. And what they are, I know there are the other, the standalones, which I'll get to yeah. uh, later. But the, the Brigginshaw Chronicles start off with a lovely little story about a nouveau rich man who wants to become part of society and get a title and the only way he can do this is by marrying his daughter off no. marrying his son off to the daughter That's correct. Of, yep. uh, of a marquis who's in exactly the opposite situation That's right. where he's got the title and the land but, but hasn't no got, a part, got no money at all and they come to this arrangement and there's a slight confusion in that he the, the marquis presumes that the, the bridegroom in question will be the younger son who he knows his daughter is very fond of. That's right. But in fact, it, it's not, it's the older son. Yep. No, I want my older son to have the title. The Bort, the yeah, Bort son. Uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> so that's how it starts, and I thought, I like this, because that's my kind of period. OK. My kind of period. I'm a huge fan of Georgette Hare and uh, anything like that. It's, it's not, it doesn't go about that far, but it's kind of turn of the it's century. It's 1887. 1887, yeah. fine. So I'm very happy with that. And I read it and I enjoy it. And then, oh, there's another one. <laughs> well, I'm now in uh, the 60s and the middle of the formation of, uh, you know. Yeah. Nelson Mandela's in it now. No, is he in it? He's mentioned it, yeah, okay. yeah, he's mentioned yeah. it. And, and the training camp set up in, yeah. in, uh, by... Uh, and a guy who I'm taking to be a model for Mugabe, really... Um, Joseph Makaya. Not quite. No, he's one of um, he's one of the um, the guys the part Zappu, of the team. Yeah. yeah. So we've yeah. moved forward. That's right. Yeah, you have this huge amount of time. And I've just pre-ordered the other three. There's three more which are going to take us up. It's they are. To 1994, I think it will take you up to. Ah. Yeah. And then after that, it will be the continuation on probably close to the year 2000, I would say. Right. Um, and then unfortunately. My father was writing the last novel, uh, which was number 18. And, and when did your father die? He died in 2018. OK, so yeah. they go right up to there. But to 2000, yeah. So they start off in 1887 and then finish off in the year 2000, so, uh, roughly. We think. We haven't got to that stage yet. The so. workload should be a, a man who started writing in his early 20s and, he did. and wrote religiously all Absolutely. the way through. But he had a completely different life as well. He did. He, Tell um, us a bit about your father. Oh, where do we begin? Um, so he basically started writing when he was probably about 22, 23. Right. And literally carried on writing till the day he died. Um, but before he actually really got stuck into the Brigginshaw Chronicles, he was running his own insurance business. And um, he ran that until he was uh, until he was about 37. Uh, it was an international insurance brokerage. So he's got a lot of ex life experience, which comes out in his books. So you'll see a lot of insurance comes out. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of insurance. Yeah, massive. Because that was his life. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, until uh, about 19... Uh, sorry, when he was 37, um, he retired, um, kind of from the insurance business. And he became an entrepreneur and did other bits of work, but always writing. Always, always writing. But what, were they getting published? I was just going to come to that. All right, so, sorry, go on. no, no. So, in probably the early 1990s, um, HarperCollins in Zimbabwe 
discovered him. Right. And they published two of his standalone books, Cry the Fish Eagle and Vultures in the Wind. Right. And they got published in Zimbabwe. And my dad was like, wow, this is it. I've yeah. made it. But he hadn't. So he's still... Um, because unfortunately with the Zimbabwe situation, the economics, etc., 